Hello and welcome to Decoding the Gurus, the podcast where a psychologist and an anthropologist listen to the greatest minds of the world has to offer and we try to understand what they're talking about. I'm Matt Brown, the co-host is Chris Kavanagh, and this is a special Right to Reply episode, isn't it, Chris? Who have we got with us today? We have with us one Stephen Bonnell, also known as Destiny, who we recently covered and invoked the secret right to reply rights. So thank you for coming on, Stephen, and staying up late, which was appreciated. Yeah, thanks for having me. Am I on? Am I in? You're on and you're in. Okay. So typically the way this works, though, it to be fair, it's only been invoked about three or four times because every time we cover people, they're not usually the type of people that respond well to being covered. So, but there technically is a format where we allow people to raise any points of dispute or issues or like, you know, anything we got wrong or, or just questions or that kind of thing. And then afterwards, move on to more discussion and questions that came up from the stuff that we covered or elsewhere. Um, mm -hmm. And in your case, we did get a lot of feedback. <laughs> you may not know it, but you're quite a controversial figure on like people have opinions. <laughs> Crazy. So, yeah, I've heard yeah. this recently. Um, I'm curious, for the people that refuse to exercise their right of reply, uh, and I imagine there's people that obviously take issue with a lot of the coverage you give them, what's their number one reason or what are the most common reasons you hear them say for why they don't want to come on and chat about it? Well, the biggest reason they don't come on is, is frankly because we're not important enough. That would be the biggest reason. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah, that's, right. that's, that's, a, that's the most important factor. The second one is that a lot of the people we cover identify anybody that is given even mild critical pushback as like bad faith actors, right? Mm -hmm. So in that case, if they do acknowledge it, it is usually just to say that we are not worth their time or or an example of a, the kind of people that people shouldn't listen to. So okay. that that tends to be the reaction. But there has been exceptions. Sam Harris has taken up his right to reply twice with varying degrees of success. <laughs> so, and we had uh, Chris Williamson, who you chatted with back in the day. Yeah, gotcha. that was more successful. Sam Harris is like my final boss guy that I really want to chat with. I'm like, so like, I'm, I'm more, I would be more excited to chat with him than Joe Rogan. I really want to, hopefully someday it'll happen, but you know. Be careful what you wish for. Yeah, be you, <laughs> yeah, be ca you, know, you know, I heard you on the stream talking about this issue when you're debating people about that you raise a question or ask people something and they monologue or they waffle on and on, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just saying that well. might be something to, to think about if you do end up talking to Sam. So. Sure. Okay. But, but how about you, Stephen? We got the, the feedback from your feedback that um, the reception was generally positive, but um, maybe you got a few bones to pick or a few points of explanation to make or... Uh, I'm going to be honest, having somebody cover me and not call me a pedophile Nazi for like two hours is actually... The bar is in hell. So the coverage isn't that. I'm actually incredibly grateful. So <laughs> um, I feel like when, um, and I say all of this cautiously because for all I know, if I dig deeper into your guys' stuff, you're just as problematic as everybody else, which uh, maybe you get the uh, impression when you dig into other people. It's hard to get people to make serious considerations, I feel, of other people's ideas. So for instance, if somebody says like, oh my God, we need to kill these fucking people, blah, blah, blah. Somebody will say that and somebody will come away with that and be like, oh, he just wants to murder all people instead of like looking at, okay, well, when he says kill all landlords, like what's actually going on here, you know, like the statement itself can be problematic, but there might be something underneath that we need to consider as well. And yeah, I just find when most people are considering stuff of mine, um, I've probably done, I don't know if it'd be an exaggeration to say, I'm, I've probably done more broadcasted content than almost anybody in existence, uh, just by virtue of like how unique streaming is and the fact that I've been doing it for about as long as anybody has been. It's easy to like clip 20 second statements and then have this insane caricature of me that you attack, even if there might be stuff that is worthy to criticize, like the, the actual criticism just ends up being insane, I think, yeah. I guess part of that too is that you come from that uh, gamer type background and this internet subcultures and so on. And, you know, you, the, the way you choose to express yourself is pretty uh, colorful, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like that's definitely a thing. One of the challenges of being a popular person on the internet is extracting valid criticism from demented online talk. So if a bunch of people are saying like an insanely mean, hurtful, not true thing about you, 
even if that criticism seems like bullshit, it's coming from somewhere and it behooves you if you want to survive in this arena or at least adapt so that people can understand you better to figure out like where it comes from. I think that um, when people criticize me for, obviously I use colorful language where I can get unhinged at times, I definitely admit that. However, like the same types of strategies I believe are used to character assassinate basically anybody, right? So like on the other spectrum from me, you could compare me to say uh, Biden. Biden doesn't generally make unhinged, crazy statements, but my God, every single time I talk to a conservative about Biden, it, they're telling me about like, remember the speech that he gave in front of the all red background when he said he that half of Americans were racist and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, if I look at the speech, he's like, he tries to qualify so much where he's like, not all Republicans are mega people. Not all Republicans deny the election, but that doesn't matter. They still like assassinate on like the one or two lines. So yeah, I definitely don't do myself any favors, but I don't know substantively or significantly if the criticism against me would change if I hadn't made certain statements. That's just my feeling, but yeah, I could be wrong. Like you say, you've been doing this a long time, right? So you know the kind of statements I imagine that are like going to be clipped. I mean, like recently you intentionally said things, right? So that they would like about the the Jewish shekels being paid to you, right? For your commentary. So like in that case, I get it because you're basically trolling for the, the lowest common denominator response to show that they're not, they're not even trying to do things in good faith, right? Because you then immediately after will say it's a joke. But mm -hmm. in the case where like, the, f the clip that we played, and we played the longer context of it, where you were talking about the, you know, the situation in Palestine and Israel before the conflict, mm -hmm. and you made the the front row way line about, you know, at this stage, I I think we sh should just genocide the the Palestinians, or not we, but like they should, or, and then you went on to talk about the actual situation and say, well, honestly, there's no solution, right? And I get your point that you the fact that it's obvious if you listen to the rest of it, that you're not calling for a genocide, right? Mm -hmm. But you saying that, or in general, kind of layering in those hyperbolic or extreme statements, doesn't that make it like easy for people to do? And like, you know, it's going to happen. So does it just not matter? Or uh, um, why, I mean, I, I, why say them? Yeah, I mean, I, if it's going to be something like that, I try generally to avoid that. I usually won't make something so blatant. That um, that was just a matter of being incredibly unlucky uh, because this happened before the conflict. Like nobody was really actively talking about this. This was on like a this is on like a, I think I was playing games on the stream and it was like Wes was like he's like not a political person. He was just like asking me questions. Um, so I'm kind of like yeah, I'm being a bit hyperbolic. Like it would be akin to um, like if somebody were to ask me like, do you think that OJ? Uh, you know, do you think that OJ should have been convicted? And, you know, I'm like, listen, the prosecutor, you know, they fucked up hard. You know, God bless OJ. Listen, he beat the system and, you know, he's free. And if the American system fails and fuck it. And then, like, imagine a month later, it comes out that 15, uh, you know, different women's bodies were found in his backyard. And then people start playing that clip. And I was like, well, don't you think you probably shouldn't have said, you know, God bless OJ for beating the system? It's like, yeah, I guess I probably should have. But like, Jesus, I didn't know that the context would change so significantly at the time. Like post October 7th, I don't think I'm going to open up with that hyperbolic of a statement. Like, yeah, you know what? Fuck it. Why don't we just fucking genocide the other? Because that's the only way this conflict is going to end. Obviously, because the sensitivity around the topic and the attention is so much higher. So yeah, I mean, like it'll it'll happen. In general, I do try to avoid like the ultra leading hyperbolic statements like that. But um, yeah, that was just <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, not a not good timing on that. Yeah, there's a reason why it took like two months, I think, after the conflict began for people to even find that and dig that up and then start like spreading it like I just said it or something. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So oh, also wait, can I also can I just say one thing too? Mm. Not to say that, and this is always like my biggest issue, somebody could make the argument that hyperbolic rhetoric like that for a variety of reasons is damaging or contributes to like a negative discourse, which is fair. I, I would argue against it, but that is an argument that can be made. My biggest issue with people is usually just that they're making arguments against these unhinged positions of like, oh, destiny wants all the Palestinians to be killed. It's like, that's obviously that's not, I don't think any person wants like every Palestinian to be killed except for the most in insanely unhinged people. But yeah, that my issue is usually just that the criticisms are very very poor in terms of what they're actually criticizing. Yeah. So I guess like the thing that I'm thinking about is I've, I've seen you in a bunch of content talking about like wanting to provide a more reasonable alternative to like the, you know, more, a lot of like popular leftist content can be pretty extreme. Right. And it's good for people, especially in like online and kind of Twitch and kick and rumble and all that to see just reasonable or like more moderate points of view. But then there is the tendency 
that like when people go to your Twitter account, right, depending on when they go, they might come across like, you know, the recent tweets directed at Ludwig or at Hassan, right, with the N word and the J Dan reference, right, which yeah. in that case, it feels like if you were trying to, you know, say, okay, like take things down a notch, that that's the message that sometimes comes across in like your stream in the mainstream interviews. But then on Twitter, it feels like the gloves come off like fairly quickly and your Reddit community tends to notice that as well, right? You will see Fred saying, oh God, <laughs> like, yeah. like uh, well, Stephen, uh, why, why not? Or this kind of thing. So I'm, I'm just curious, like in that case, is it in intentional or is it an impulse control thing or what do you I think we have to disaggregate a few things here so firstly on the when I advocate for like reasonableness or whatever it's not necessarily like civility although I think civility Mm -hmm. can be important too like when I say reasonableness what I mean is just like I want people to have a thorough understanding of the things they're talking about like well-informed opinions and the ability to read an entire article for five minutes from start to finish rather than to uh, you know eat a headline and then digest that and have your whole opinion develop from you know a a 20 calorie tweet Um, when I talk about that. Now, separate from that, um, when you ask me about Twitter, okay, no man's land, um, there are several different things that could be happening at any one point in time. Um, there are certain tweets that are intentional and edgy. So like the JDAM N-word tweet, I think that these things are important for me is because one, they adjust my audience expectations. I don't care much about like slurs. Uh, I don't think we should call people slurs and I don't defend it and I don't call people slurs, but when people like pearl clutch over like a particular word or they pearl clutch over um, like a particular thing, especially in the defense of using slurs. So this was like in the cracker debate or whatever. Can you call white people yeah. slurs? In that point, uh, I will deploy a tactical slur uh, as a joke, <laughs> not like calling somebody the N word or whatever in a, in a pejorative way. Um, yeah, because it adjusts my audience expectation. It keeps everybody like, understanding well this is what he thinks about this and if people don't like it i can understand why and then it also like triggers the fuck of the other people now that's separate from say when i was fighting with ludwig um there were a couple issues there one is uh I am human and I do make mistakes. There are probably times when I fight with people and I'm sure I could go through several of these where I go too far. Um, not even such that I'm being too mean, but that I'm violating principles that even I think I shouldn't be doing. Like these are things that are generally just a mistake. I shouldn't have said this or I got way too heated or too upset. And then another issue that I have, um, this is on the strategic side, not the moral side, is because I let so much stuff slide all the time about me because so many people are saying so many things, when I am like boiling over and I become unhinged, it kind of seems like it comes from nowhere. So even in my own fan base, a lot of people saw me fighting with Ludwig and then invoking Cutie and they're like, this is like so much just because he tweeted like a, you know, a, a meme at you, like why? And then one thing that I'm trying to do more now is I'm trying to lay out now that I've got like people clipping stuff, like these are all the things that these people say about me. This is where the frustration comes from. It's so irritating that there's no accountability on their side. But then as soon as I say something now, like not only are their communities trying to hold me to account, my own community is holding me account and that's driving me crazy. That doesn't justify me being unhinged, but I'm trying to do a better job at keeping track of what other people are saying about me. So there is at least some kind of public accountability created there. But yeah. Sorry, that was a lot. Yeah, because in no that that makes sense, and I I think in like in one in that recent case, it might have also been particularly joined because you did a stream with Doctor K, right, which was like quite a reflective stream uh, mm-hmm. about you know the, the how to you know I don't know better communicate or whatever Doctor K talks about, but then the next day there was the the interaction, and like you say, mm-hmm. I think it the, the context does matter but in the in the case where like so i i think from hearing your explanation that you were referencing that ludwig and other people will make reference to like your private life and you know like past relationships or this kind of thing and then when you respond in kind people like respond as if you're you're suddenly went low for no reason right Mm -hmm. you mentioned his girlfriend and talk about deep fakes allowing yeah. us all to enjoy, right? That, so yeah. that that kind of thing. So it's it's the sense that people are doing the same thing to you and you're not allowed to 
respond in kind? Is that kind yeah, of? It's, the- it's two. It's two things going on. One is the um, difference in accountability. So I genuinely believe, and I would fight that for any creator within an order of magnitude of size of me. I think that I have the most moderated community on the internet. Um, which, if you listen to anybody else, they would say that I have the most unhinged community on the internet. But like, if you go through threads where I think I called Casey Tron like a fat. I said <laughs> I hate this lady. Okay, but like I've said things about people that I don't like, political opponents that I don't like that are probably crossing my values where I say things like we probably shouldn't tell people for their looks or stuff like this. And when I say things like that, like my own community will post up like, hey, we probably shouldn't be doing this or I don't know why Destiny is saying this or did we change our mind on this, um, which is good, right? And I might even be ass mad at the time. I might even like fucking tap ban somebody because I'm like ass mad or whatever. But like in retrospect, like that's good. They're, like those corrective mechanisms in my community are valuable to me and I appreciate those. Um, but on an emotional level, when I have a lot of accountability for my community and then I look into other communities and those communities have zero accountability for those people and they green light attacks that should be contrary to those communities. So for instance, um, they might talk a lot about how like, oh, well, we shouldn't uh, make uh, like, well, we need to defend all LGBT and sexuality and this is so important and blah, blah, blah. But then like when I'm brought up, like spamming pictures of like some black girl getting railed, making cuck jokes is all of a sudden like the funniest thing in the world. And it's like, okay, well, that feels really annoying. And then in their community, if anybody calls them out, they get downvoted out of existence and then banned. And it's like, okay, that dual accountability like fucks with my head a lot. And then on the second, the second part of that is um, there's a concept called crazy making where, uh, especially for people that take videos of their significant others, like having an outbreak where you can poke and poke and poke and poke and poke somebody so much. And then when they break, you like record it or you account for it in some way. You tell people about it and you're like, man, you were super unhinged. And then you act like you've done nothing. And that also drives me crazy. It's one of the reasons why I preferred fighting with like, like, I like the Nazi communities because when they call me names or they go unhinged or crazy, I expect it. But if I go unhinged on them, they're never coming back with like, I can't believe that Destiny said this or that about, you know, Richard Spencer or Sargon McCart or Nick Fuentes or blah, blah, because they expect it. Whereas on the other side, it's like, oh my God, you really said or did this? And it's like, yeah, you motherfuckers have been saying like worse shit about me. Like Hassan literally called me Di Forcelli like 20 times per street. What the fuck? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's not some, I mean, we're not the civility police. <laughs> like, <laughs> like we, we're much less polite about most of the characters we cover. Um, which sure. we're, when we don't like them it is important like civility some level of civility is important though like i shouldn't do that like these are human emotional responses that are not like i'm giving you reasons why it happens i'm not justifying them like if i was a better person i could be above that or i wouldn't like fall prey to that there's just a lot of public pressure but the civility part is important i don't mean some people use civility politics as a like an insult like oh you just want to be polite to everybody but like some base level of civility is probably necessary for us to communicate with each other so yeah yeah civility porn is a term that we reference like civility is good but but like constantly talking about how incredible it is that you're able to talk to yeah. someone who you largely agree with is yeah it, it comes up a lot in the content that we look at yeah i think the thing that interests us um steven it, it's not it's not really a criticism it's just it's just an interesting thing which is that you do seem to have those multiple speeds like on one hand like you are it seems to us incredibly consistent in terms of your arguments and your stances on important sort of topics but you know you can be talking about a very serious topic and you know marshalling you know robust points in a in a very uh, rigorous way at one time and then listen to other content you're like litigating um some personal relationship thing and people taking pictures of penises or or whatever and you sort of deploy the same you take that with the same level of seriousness and i I get the impression you you spend a lot of time on that kind of stuff as well again it's not a not having to go i'm just just curious like what's What's why? <laughs> I don't know. I feel like um, growing up, I think something that I always valued was I think it's cool when individuals are less specialized and more, more. I don't want to say more generalized, but not necessarily like sliding into hardcore archetypes. Uh, like I like the idea of a really nerdy guy that reads a lot, but is also like a quarterback. Or I like the idea of, you know, like a hardcore Rambo soldier who also like finger paints. Or I like the idea of, of people having uh, like kind of, I don't want to say breaking molds, but I guess it's kind of like that. Yeah, just like having a collection of, of attributes. Um, I value my intelligence. I like researching. I like debating. I have huge interest in politics. Um, I'm also like, you know, a super sexualized person. I like to, you know, hook up and sleep around with people. Um, I like to do drugs sometimes. I think are super fun. Um, I like cars. I like guns. You've got one behind you. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, there's, just like, <laughs> there's a lot of things that I enjoy. And yeah, I guess because my life is so open, I end up sharing all of these things. And 
sometimes it's confusing because it seems like you wouldn't associate some of these things with other people. Other people say that like, well, you shouldn't be so open about all these things. There are pros and cons to it. So is that like part of the um, sort of package? Like you're, you're very upfront about, you know, like you run a business essentially, right? And you provide a, a product and you make um, money from it. And we commented on that. We found it quite refreshing um, because a lot of other people present themselves as something quite different. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, part of it seems to be that, um, you know, people uh, are in, can engage with you on political topics, but can also engage and, and be a part of your, like the real life, right? So, so those parasocial dynamics, which, which we experience too, being podcasters are, are real and they're not always negative. But is that part of the appeal? Like, how, how would you describe the, the product that you offer your audience and, and how much of it is, is, is the, is the drama and the, and the, mm. the, the personal beefs and things like that. Yeah. I think when you come to my stream, I think there's a few things you're getting. One is uniqueness. So if you're listening to me, give a take on something, this is my take on it. Um, as opposed to, uh, th there's a lot of progressive commentators where I could, li I could write the scripts for any take they're going to have, you know, like, oh, well this came out, America was on this side. They're probably going to be against it. Or for far right commentators, you know, um, a political topic came out, Biden said this, well, they're probably going to say that. They don't trust this or they don't believe this. Um, if you come to my stream, I think you genuinely aren't, uh, I don't want to say you don't know what I'm going to say because that makes it sound like it's a random or chaotic, but rather at least you know that I'm going to have my own unique individual interpretation of a particular thing. That's a big thing, the uniqueness. Um, a second thing is I think the authenticity. I think I, I hope I come off as a pretty authentic person. Again, there's like there's so much information about me online, aside from even just all of the hours streamed, there's like people try to leak stuff about me or talk about me behind the scenes or whatever. And I think every single thing that has ever been leaked or every single thing that's ever gone has usually gone to show that I'm more or less, if anything, I'm like even more soft or generous in real life. Like sometimes like things I pay people will get leaked and people are like, I can't believe you paid, you know, $5,000 for music for this D&D thing, or I can't believe he's paying this employee like X thousand a month or blah, blah, blah. Um, and yeah, nothing like leaks that's like a surprise to anybody. Something that I said before about like, you know, tweeting a certain thing at Hassan about JDAMs or whatever, and for adjusting audience expectations is that the, the, the on, on the map of where people think I am, uh, if you're genuinely following my stuff and like on the map of where I actually am, these are basically always overlapping. And I think evidence of this comes out whenever I get into big fights with people, like I never lose like huge fights that involve like leaking or character attacks because like my character is basically who I am. Like nothing is ever going to leak that surprises my fan base um, about like, oh my God, I can't believe he would do this or say that. Cause it's like, you, you get what you see and you see what you get. Um, whereas when I like, when I fight with other people, sometimes stuff will leak or things will come out. It's like, wait, what? I can't believe he does this or he does that and then the evidence for this is when you look at big fights that people get it online i don't think there's ever been a huge drama that i've been involved in where i've lost subscribers it's never happened other people on the internet might get mad and attack me or, or get upset or whatever but generally speaking except for my big communism split people usually know exactly where i'm at for everything so whenever we were looking at your content and you know looking at the different aspects of it there were parts of it which mainly were the content dealing with orbiters right which matt referenced having a dynamic a little bit like reality TV because mm -hmm. there are big characters, there are people who have slept together, who are now feuding, who, you know, like uh, might make up, might not. And one thing is just, do you think that comparison is, is fair? And then the second thing about it is like coming from the background that we do, academia or like a more podcast, the arena area, the notion of like having intimate relationships with listeners or people in the orbit just just seems like I mean you know Matt and I being uh, the people that we are it might be something to do with it as well but I mean in general that boundary right that the there's always like a parasocial imbalance when you are you know the mm -hmm. kind of bigger content creator and the person around which others are orbiting so I'm curious about that. Because in one in one respect, whenever I see you on the stream of like love and Mr. Girl and all this this kind of uh, like drama, it, for me it would be absolutely exhausting to deal with that. But for you, it seems to be like another week. And I I'm just curious: is that you know personality differences and different boundaries, or how do you feel? I realize there's about eight layered questions on there, so yeah. wherever you want to go. For the first question, it was when you said, is the comparison fair? Do you mean like comparing my stream to like reality TV or? 
Yeah. 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 In terms of the orbiter dynamics, yeah. not, you know, the debates and that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I think it's somewhat fair. I mean, people watch reality TV because it's like the basis form of human drama, right? Like you're seeing people that are doing things that in some ways are entirely relatable, like having romantic, you know, uh, quibbles or having um, fights with people or, uh, you know, disagreements over stuff or crushes on people or whatever. And then in other ways, it's totally unrelatable. Like it's like people that are larger than life that are doing this, you know? So seeing like Kim Kardashian navigate a relationship is there in some ways you totally relate. And in other ways, these are like aliens too. So that's like, yeah. um, it's, a, it's a big captivating thing to, to witness online. So yeah, I, I think the comparison is fair there. Now, obviously there's like a, there's a loading of a uh, reality TV that makes it seem like it's not intellectual content or it's worthless. And when you talk about like the stuff I'm involved in dramatically, uh, there's a large element of truth to that. I don't think your life is being enriched <laughs> by you know watching Mr. Roland Lav you know go back and forth for hours on stream, but it's funny as fuck. Um, and not everything we do is for life enrichment. There are baser uh, desires mm -hmm. that we can fulfill, um, and I like to hop between those. I think it's fun. It gives me a variety of things to do. Um, admittedly, <laughs> um, I, I don't know if this is an advertisement for medication, but since I've started my Vivance, I've had very little desire to participate in that. So for about seven months, my stream has been almost absent completely of any drama like that because I just don't have as much of an interest. Maybe that was like a thrill seeking aspect of like a dopamine star brain. I'm not sure, but yeah, it was definitely entertaining and exciting. Um, the intimate relationship thing with people in my field, that's a really interesting and challenging question to deal with. So here's an interesting thing. When you're a streamer, depending on the type of streamer you are, your life kind of revolves around your work. So like I'm streaming for like, my goal is to stream for eight hours a day. I'm doing emails and messages before and after. I might be traveling for podcast appearances and then I'm doing other stuff relating to upkeep of stream, whether that's management of employees, website, scheduling travel, negotiating like sponsorship or like there's just a million things, like probably 14 hours a day. Um, and anybody that's ever dated me will complain about this. It's like going into work related stuff. So when that's the case, the people that are available to you to date are basically two types of people. It's either fans or it's either colleagues. <laughs> so you're in an interesting spot because uh, I remember when I moved to California when I was 30, um, for a couple years on Tinder, I removed all of my social stuff because I just wanted to meet people that didn't know everything about me. That was an interesting and fun experience. And for a while, it was fun to meet somebody and then get to like introduce myself to somebody again. I'm like, oh, this is interesting. But then there is like this wall that exists between us of like, I don't know how to explain to you that I'm a little bit irritated today because there's a guy online that tweeted about me being a pedophile and he got 20,000 likes and it's just really irritating. Like there's no way to make an, an ordinary person understand that type of struggle. Or like, yeah, like listen, um, this might be crazy, but like just because we appeared in a picture together, there might be people that try to like send you DMs asking you really weird questions or hacking your account because they're trying to get more information about me. Like just ignore that. Like most people can't handle that. So then you go to the other part and you're like, okay, well now you have fans or you've got uh, colleagues. Well, immediately people write off fans because that's like power dynamics and abuse and toxic and blah, 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 whatever. So now you've got colleagues, but then colleagues, in my opinion, are actually more problematic because the power dynamic you have over a colleague is actually more severe than the power dynamic over a fan, right? If there's a fan and I want to be abusive, like I can exploit the fact that this person really likes me. Um, and that's about it, right? Which that can be really abused, by the way. But with a colleague, I could theoretically hold your career in my hand. And that's like so much more power. So where I'm at right now is I basically just like, okay, well, if you're like aware of my content, if you message me, if we chatted, that's basically the types of people that I'm talking to or trying to date right now, because colleagues are that is a whole clusterfuck of shit. And people that are outside of this world completely like have no understanding of how crazy it is. And it's impossible to ask them to step into that life as a romantic partner. <laughs> I guess there's a you can always cut me off whenever I say something too, if you want no, to no, it's, it's, ramble for it's, longer, it's, it's, it's actually just percolating in my head about the, the situation of streamers and their, their dating life. It's not something that I've, I've considered in, in great detail, but your content, covering your content did make me think about it more. And uh, this is probably like a little bit tangential, but I, I think speaks to like a similar sort of issue. Because I would imagine there are very, very devoted fans that, you know, you could tell it would be a problem, right? That there would be an unhealthy aspect that you, you know, could exploit from that like one way relationship. But this is like slightly different, but your audience, I remember seeing somewhere and it might've been in Mr. Girl's document. So I'll hope that your yeah. uh, assessment of it um, for the credibility, but it was something about like that your audience has like significant proportion that is kind of male in early twenties uh, demographic. Is that accurate? I think so. Probably, probably closer to like mid ish twenties. Cause I I've been streaming for a long time and I do politics. I just skew a bit older, but yeah, I think probably. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. So the, the thing which I encountered, which 
kind of surprised me, and it relates to the the DDoS kid, which was obviously going to come up. But the, um, <laughs> so you know, we can we can talk about the the DDoS kid, but but in particular here. The, so your community has, as you said, a reputation right, for being highly activated. And it is highly activated in the terms of like clipping. And whenever Ludwig mentioned some event from years ago, people were able to find the clip from an old stream, right? That showed that he was misrepresenting events, right? With the yeah. throwing the cheese poofs or whatever they are. And that is true that there is an activated element to it. But I find that whenever we did the episode on you, and on our subreddit and your subreddit, people were discussing the episode and the DDoS kid came up. Some of the people that were talking about that, they were essentially, I, I find it interesting because I interacted with them and was basically saying, okay, but like, I've heard all the arguments that Stevens made about the, the DDoS kid, right? But come on, <laughs> come on, like, you, you know, kind of, you can agree that he has these points that he can make, but you don't have to completely accept his reasoning. And the thing that surprised me was that there was a bunch of, yeah, yes, there are lots of people that are critical and, you know, have their own point of view, but there were some people who were essentially repeating everything that you'd said using the exact same, you know, example mm -hmm. to respond. And to completely justify it. And that stance, I think you would agree, right? Like whether or not you agree with you, it is still like quite an extreme stance, right? Probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for people that aren't aware of the ins and outs, like this is related to the, the moral legitimacy of potentially murdering someone for interfering with your income. And it, in this case, happens to be like a minor. I would uh, use the word killing, not murdering. It's a little bit less <laughs> normatively loaded, but okay, sure, yeah. But yeah. yeah, so, you know, even in the realms of like moral philosophy version of it, it it's still a relatively extreme take. And the thing mm -hmm. that kind of surprised me was that there were people that would like kind of regurgitate your take exactly, uncritically. And I... I know I've heard you, I think you and other people, other streamers, talk about this dynamic about how that's not what you want to encourage, right? And how when that is happening, when people are just repeating things kind of uncritically, that that's a bad dynamic. So the question is one about like the extent to which you think that exists in the community and maybe two, is are there ways that you discourage that or do you think, you know, that's just there's always going to be an element of the community which ends up repeating things like uncritically. Yeah, I think both parts of that second statement can be true. That like, um, I, I, there are ways that I try to discourage people from doing that. Like, I'll, I'll say like, you know, this is how we should think through this, or I'll try to keep like both. Depending on the issue we're going through, I'll try to present both sides of the argument. Where you know, it's like, well, listen, like this is my feeling on this, but like it, you could also keep this in mind. We should think about this. You know, today, I don't know when this episode airs, but today there was the ICC stuff that dropped, um, where the prosecutor was making a request for a warrant for the arrest of um, Netanyahu and Gallant, and then the three Hamas leaders. Where like when I start off by reading this, I'm like, listen, there's going to be a lot of people politically that you know want a certain outcome from this, but we should see what the prosecutor says before we like dig through his background or anything like that. We should like look at the actual words here in the statement, and we should read this entire thing. Um, so I, I tried it have people at least like keeping in mind the other side or I try to stress the importance of being able to play devil's advocate of being able to argue the other side. Um, so hopefully my community is better than most when it comes to representing both sides of an argument because that's a value that I hold and if they're going to copy from me, hopefully they copy that. But I, at the same time, like realistically, there are going to be people that just copy my opinions and uncritically, you know, parrot whatever I say. Now I would argue that that's better because my opinions are better than other people's opinions, but I mean, their opinions. So hopefully everybody thinks that you should think you have the best opinions. Otherwise, why would you have a, a, a not the best opinion? You should change it to the best one. Um, so yeah, I mean, like in the case where people are copying, I was like, well, fuck it, at least they're copying what I would consider to be a more informed opinion. But yeah, ideally I would want people to be able to explore their, um, explore whatever applied things they're looking at. Like, do I feel this way about healthcare or treating people this particular way? And that that's running with, in, a, in concordance with whatever internal values or uh, beliefs they have. Since you mentioned um, the Israel thing, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that's been one of these hot button issues that is controversial, obviously. Um, and, you know, in, you know, you've been perceived as being like a, a staunch defender, if not an apologist for Israel. Um, so I realize you've just been talking about this. I'm sorry, I haven't, I haven't seen what you've said, but what do you say about it at the moment? How, um, in light of this ICC development and stuff, do you have criticisms of Israel's conduct 
Yeah, um, yeah, I think, it, it, yeah, there's a lot of criticisms. I mean, outside the war, I think Israel has made a massive strategic blunder uh, diplomatically and politically when it comes to negotiating a, a final settlement with the Palestinians. I, I think that this idea that you can kick the can down the road forever and continue with this capsulized theory of bilateral peace agreements with neighboring Arab states and just ignore the Palestinians forever is absurd. Things like, you know, 2008. Uh, things like 2014, um, you know, Cast Lead, Protected Edge, things like the Great March Return in 2018, things like the October 7th attacks, like it's going to continue to happen. It shouldn't really be surprising. Like if you're going to continue to refuse to, you know, approach them with strong, you know, like advocators for peace, like they're going to continue to fight an attack. Like they're not going anywhere. Like that would be stupid to imagine that. Um, so yeah, I think that Israel has made a massive diplomatic blunder there, especially because um, Israel is existing under this delusion that there's some peace that can be negotiated with Palestinians that won't be painful. And with every single new permit authorized for every new house, for every single expanded outpost that turns into a settlement, that turns into an additional area C that wants to be annexed, like that price is going to become increasingly painful because it, it can't just continue on like this. Like the, the situation is untenable. The status quo doesn't work. So yeah, everything relating to the, the collective delusion that Israel has been under after 67, that they can hold on to the West Bank without penalty is, is it's absurd on so many different levels. Um, I understand it. I know where it comes from, you know, same way I would say the Palestinians have their delusions that aren't, aren't being helped by the world. Um, but I understand where theirs come from as well. Um, but yeah, Israel is not beyond reproach for sure. Uh, but I, I don't even get to explore those criticisms because most of the pro-Palestinians I argue with are unhinged and delusional. And <laughs> it's, there aren't many pro-Zionists that I, I've argued with a few of them, but like one was like, the, most of them are from Israel. Um, like Simcha Rachman, I think was a guy in the Knesset I argued with. And then I've argued with a couple big Zionist, pro-Zionist people, but most of the people online today are like super pro-Palestinian. That was a point that I was curious about because I, I saw some stuff in the lead up to the debate with Norm Finkelstein and I forget who the other guy was. Oh, Norm Finkelstein and um, Juan uh, Rabani. Juan Rabani. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Benny Morris was on your side right now. Yeah. So in, in the lead up to that, I heard you express like what I would have viewed as positive anticipation. Like, you know, you, you had some back and forth with Norm, but it sounded like you had hoped that there would be like an exchange and that people would see that maybe in regards like with Benny Morris, that there was some areas of disagreement, right? And then, of course, what happened in that debate, it didn't end up because it was just, you know, insults and treating barbs and, and kind of completely distinct historical accounts, right? And I, yeah. I was curious about, in that case, so you seem disappointed that it ended up like that. And did you have a, a more positive image of Norm Finkelstein before the interaction? Like, were you hoping that it would be more than that or did you kind of anticipate that that was always going to be what it what it was the the most embarrassing thing is i'm pretty sure you can find me co saying comments prior to that that i was like i think this has the potential to be like one of the best uh on youtube conversations about this particular conflict for two reasons one is because Norm has such an extensive background as being pro-Palestinian, and two, because Benny Morris is one of the most respected historians in the field. And then um, Muin Rabani has his background that he can contribute as a uh, Palestinian, Palestinian advocate. And then I've got like my, I'm pretty rhetorically effective and I can follow pretty sharply like logic and stuff. And I've like done a little bit of reading uh, compared to these guys, like so I can follow along at least. And the fact, so that, that was one, it was the people involved, especially Norm and Benny. And then two, the format, the idea that we could have, rather than these fucking 20 minute, no, I'm sorry, not 20 minute, rather than these like two minute, you know, 20 second exchanges back and forth, we can have like a five to six hour sit down and really into detail hash out like the differences in the perceptions of historical fact between two sides with these figures was like that was like a legendary uh, opportunity i thought to have an amazing conversation going back and forth between the histories of, of both of these people and yeah i didn't i didn't i couldn't imagine that it would have turned into such the shit show that it was that was unbelievably excruciatingly humiliated. It was vindicating for me on a personal level. I felt like super happy on a personal level, um, just in terms of myself, but um, in terms of like what that conversation could have been in a wider respect, I think it was like really embarrassing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just generally disappointing, isn't it? Um, like yourself, I'm not an expert, but I've read histories of the region and, and I've read like really good commentary from moderate Palestinians and moderate Israelis. And the amazing thing about them is that they're is that they're very, very similar. Like they're not, they're not on a like entirely different page. But when you, especially when you look at the the international discourse that's happening online, 
um, it, looking into the area like a fishbowl, it seems like it seems like um, it's happening on a much poorer level than even people yeah. who are actually there and experiencing it. If you follow the facts given by both sides, like the conclusions are so obvious and the only possible outcome is the total elimination of one side because they're so unholy that the pro-Palestinian myth of uh, Jews were injected artificially into the Middle East in an area they didn't belong and then perpetually supported by Brits and then Americans who wanted to see the racist destruction and subjugation of Arabs led to a, you know, a racist hege hegemonic uh, bulwark in the Middle East that called itself Israel that just attempted to torture, you know, with the help of the West, all these Arabs around them until they forged their state in, in over dead Palestinian children is like, that's their side. And then on the Israeli side, um, the idea that these were underdogs alone against the world, uh, fighting against like, uh, you know, these barbaric Arabs that wanted to see nothing more than the eventual genocide of the entire state of, uh, of Israel and Jews all over the world for absolutely no reason when Jews were just wanted to live alongside in harmony with these Palestinians who, you know, had no reason to not want them there. Like, like but the myths on both sides are just so extremely divergent. And then both people, at least online and in the real world to some extent, will argue over these. And when your histories are so divergent, I mean, like, of course, the, the conclusions are going to be wildly divergent as well. Is there an issue, Stephen, given that, that like, uh, one, that, you know, because this topic now is, you know, the, the current focus in politics, but, but also on online debates and this kind of thing, that one, that it can become, you know, a kind of content generating topic, right? That like, what is Nico and Nick Fuentes' position on the Israel, like Palestine conflict? Like, it seems that getting into that feels like distasteful in a way because they, they know nothing, right? And, and then on the same point, as you've been involved with it, um, and being perceived as, you know, to be more staunchly defending Israel, that it's bound to happen that you get, you know, more, more criticisms, more pushback from the Palestinian side. And that in just by natural, like psychological tendencies, you will be more receptive to, you know, potential negative information about Palestinians. Or if there's like the, the example I can think of is whenever there was somebody suggesting that Palestinians were getting shot, you know, for the optics, right? Like mm -hmm. in, in, in order to make sympathy and that it, I'm not saying it's impossible, but I am saying like our bar for believing that should be high, right? B because the potential for being wrong would be like assuming that people that are actually being shot are doing, you know, like it's kind of false flag with Alex Jones. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious about those two things. One, the potential for it to become a kind of debate porn topic and and secondly the polarization inherent in the topic that uh, do you find yourself like being pushed just by the responses and thing towards more like polarized takes one of the big problems i have with my stuff is that i try to do functionally what a lot of people do aesthetically so um there are things that i say that are so pointless to to say because everybody says them. If I were to discover my content in a vacuum, like if I were to discover it online, like not be having any idea who I am, but I'm aware of like all the other content creators, like I think I say so many things that are red flags for you should never listen to this person. Like anybody that describes themselves as like not uh, nonpartisan or anybody that describes themselves like, oh, I'm truth seeking. I try to be aware of my biases. I just follow the facts or blah, blah, blah. Like these are usually your biggest indicators that somebody is going to be the most partisan biased hack fuck you've ever listened to in your entire fucking life. As soon as they put like truth or veritas or rational or logical or whatever in any of the shit they do. It's usually the least <laughs> rational, least logical, most emotionally driven stuff you've ever heard in your entire life. So um, that's one thing I try to be aware of. So I'll, I, mean, I mean, I'll say I try to be aware of biases that I have um, when I'm analyzing stuff and I try to apply like consistent lenses through how I view stuff. And like I encourage people in my audience because a lot of haters show up and even my own fans that don't agree with me sometimes like ask questions about how I'm evaluating things. So um, th in practice, this takes the forms of a lot of different type of critical thought, um, where when I say critical, I'm talking about like, uh, like metacognitive processes where we're trying to like analyze our own thought. And I also try to be aware of these biases too, right? Cause it's not enough to just say I have none. It's more to be like aware of them, right? If the UN publishes a statement and you know, the UN says, well, today, um, we actually feel really strongly that Israel is committing a genocide in Palestine. Like I can't lie and say, I don't have a, a bit of an emotional investment because where I've hedged my previous positions where I'm a bit more in alignment with Israel, um, it's tempting to 
dismiss it out of hand, right? Okay, yeah, of course the fucking UN says that. But then I have to think of like, I, I try to like plug in different actors when I'm thinking this to make sure that I'm not like mind fucking myself. So I might say, well, what if the UN comes out and says something about, we believe that in Buka, I think it was Buka, right? Or in, um, oh my God, I forgot the name yeah. of so many of the um, uh, Ukrainian cities where horrible atrocities have happened, Mariupol, um, these other places. Yeah, if the UN came out and made a statement uh, about Putin, I would probably believe that immediately. Well, now I have to ask myself, well, hold on. Um, am I actually listening to the UN or am I accepting or rejecting what they're saying out of hand just because of the people involved? So I need to make sure that I'm holding myself. Well, we need to do uh, either one. I need a really good reason for that. Is there a reason to trust the UN for one party and not the other, which is dangerous. You have to be really careful in that justification. And then secondly, and this is really the easier thing to do if you've got the time is, okay, well, let's just like read through the material and see how we feel about the underlying material. It's usually the best thing to do. Um, but yeah, I, I try to be aware of biases going into topics where it's like, okay, well, I really want them to say this and I'm really primed to hear this and I need to be aware of that because if I hear something that challenges it, I'm more likely to dismiss it on an emotional level rather than to factually critically consider it. So yeah, the, the swapping in different actors for a thing um, is a really important way to kind of like check my thoughts to make sure that I'm being consistent or intellectually honest and not just biased towards a particular source or party. Yeah, like you said, all of those things about being, you know, rational and uh, a seeker of truth and above, you know, mere political passions and so on it's super red flags and um mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the the kind of gurus or influences that we really despise tend to <laughs> tend to do that and they they also tend to be just totally uh duplicitous in terms of their motivations right so the the, the, the yeah. presentation is is that the, the motivations are the, are the highest ones you can imagine they're they're looking to save western civilization usually always that way in some way, in some way <laughs> form. but then you look at what they truly really excited about and it's going viral it's getting clicks it's getting it's getting an audience with someone higher up the influencer pecking order than than they are constantine kissen Springs to mind is a good example of something like this. So my question is not about about yourself this time. It's just because like you've been in the biz for so many years, and from your vantage point, you would have perceived this better than us. And and we've experienced it personally, just on our scale and the kinds of approaches, and just to seeing how people play this game. And it's a bit distasteful, to be honest. On on the other hand, I saw a thing recently where you said, "Yeah, of course I'm interested in clicks. You know what I mean? I'm a I'm a." I'm a content creator, you know, clicks, you know, oh, I need clicks. So what's your take on this sort of new media internet ecosystem in terms of the, those unhealthy dynamics? And how do you treat it like a, a business without selling your soul? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like needing clicks isn't bad. I mean, it's like it's like going out on a, on a date with a girl, right? It's like, well, I really want to have sex with this girl. So I can either, you know, like uh, pay for dinner, be engaged in the conversation, uh, make her feel like she's safe around me, uh, or, you know, or I can slip, you know, like Rufinol or whatever into her drink. And then when she's passed out, I could carry her off in my car, right? Like both of these are achieving the same end. But obviously there's like a very ethical way to go about it. There's a highly unethical way to go about it. Um, I think when it comes to like getting clicks, I think this is actually uh, fundamental. This goes really deeply into my philosophy. I think for a long time, the left made a big mistake in assuming that we're correct, so we don't have to package any of our stuff. We're just right. And the fact that we're right should be enough for people. And it is absolutely not enough for people. And for a long time, right-leaning content was just so much more human and entertaining than left-leaning content. I don't know if you guys ever listened to talk radio in the United States, but man, if you slip between like, or, or flip between like NPR and then you listen to like Michael Savage, Rush Limbaugh, Glenn Beck, like these guys were passionate speakers. They were funny. They were angry. They channeled emotion. And then you go to like the most sterile laboratory speaking on like NPR. And it's just like, ugh, like it's just not entertaining at all. You know, it's funny if you ask like who was the most influential left-leaning educator, you know, for millennials, it was probably Jon Stewart because he was funny and that's really important. So when I talk about like needing to fight for clicks, um, I have to make my stuff like, I have to be entertaining. Like, and I hope I am entertaining. Like I read stuff, we study a lot. I try not to, I try to never, I don't believe you have to sacrifice the informational part or the educational part for the entertainment. I don't think that has to happen. I think you can make it funny. You just have to like make it human for people, you know? People understand this intuitively when it comes to like classrooms, right? Like nobody would say that I had a really boring teacher, but I had this amazing teacher that got me so interested in a topic and then say, yeah, but he was an amazing teacher because he misrepresented so much and just made it entertaining. It was no, he made like the facts into 
interesting to you because he was entertaining. He was like so good at that. And that's kind of what I try to do. So like when I say like I need clicks, I can't like afford to just sit on stream for eight hours and just read a book out loud to my audience. Um, there's going to have to be other types of content that I interweave or other ways that I comment on it or argue with people over it that makes them like more drawn into it. And then hopefully as part of that educational or entertainment process, they're also like becoming more informed on the facts as well. What's the most unethical ways you, um, you've, you've seen? What's, what's the worst and most common things you mean like in terms of like getting a fan base or yeah that's right i mean i guess the, the things that that people do perhaps mostly motivated by just wanting to get a lot of clicks and be be popular like what does it what does it incentivize them to do well yeah so i guess in my world the things that you're looking for are things like um so like there's a concept called audience capture, where if you've got a particular audience and wants to hear a particular thing, that's the thing that you're more likely to feed them. And you're not doing that out of any, out of any principled obligation to a thing. You're doing it because you know that there's a big reward there. So people that co-sign others' opinions or people that form alliances with certain communities or people that carry water for certain people just because they know it'll get them clicks or people that... Um, this gets more into the sterile, like, I don't know, prop logic or philosophy analysis, but like people that engage in like bad argumentation. So when somebody's willing to make really strong claims with really high levels of conviction about things that they have no research about or no evidence of, but they know there's a big social reward for them. Like, I think that these are probably some of the worst things driving online content today, depending on the circle you're in. Uh, it, like, I, I'll, um, do you know who, uh, Ryan Long is, and um, they do the, the boys cast. It's Ryan Long and another guy. Like, I know uh, them, but you know, you know, the guys that did the woke, People are like, like far Nazis. right people, that little, oh, like yeah. Nazis, yeah, those little skit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So the first time I went on their show, I think I was uh, getting a lot of attention relating to the Rittenhouse stuff because I felt really strongly that Rittenhouse acted in self-defense and their audience loved me. Uh, and they said I was like the most reasonable liberal every, ever, anywhere. They were really appreciative of like the perspective that I brought and they you know, really just liked the fact that I was a reasonable liberal. The last time I was on the show, I was highly critical of Donald Trump and they fucking hated me. It was so much. I don't know if, yeah, are you, I don't know if you saw any comments here, but oh my God, it was like brutal. But like that idea of like, one thing I could do, there are ways where when I talk to certain people, I could only show certain opinions. And I know that would garner me a whole bunch more like clicks mm -hmm. and respect and, and desirability from those communities. And there are certain topics that I know I could stay away from that wouldn't get me in as much heat with different communities. And when I see people making decisions like that, like people are just molding themselves to the audience rather than trying to guide the audience to, to some better place. And I, I don't like that. I think that's incredibly damaging. I think it's also incredibly damaging even more so because they present themselves as doing something different, right? Like if Project Veritas was called Project Partisan, I'd have no problem with what they do, right? Oh, okay, yeah, you guys mm -hmm. just like, you push a certain political opinion, that's fine. But it's annoying when all these fuckers, uh, you know, try to operate under the aesthetic of truth and logic and reason. And it's like, okay, well, Jesus Christ, like you haven't even read these indictments that you've talked about for three months, or you're supposed to be educated in this particular thing. You don't even, you haven't even read this like paper that everybody's talking about. Like, what, how, how, you, how do you have any information on this? Like clearly your commitment to logic and reason aren't there. You're just like farming an audience for clicks and, and destroying the discourse while you're doing so. I'm going to give you credit, Stephen, as well, that one thing that I find very annoying, especially in the context that we look at, is like uh, with someone like Jordan Peterson or discussing with Sam Harris, there is the whole thing that you encountered with Jordan Peterson that you've talked about, you know, the constellation of right wing, like kind of global warming is... Uh, conspiracy concocted by the WEF to, and Trump was, you know, the voting machines, maybe they weren't tampered with, but there was a, you know, all of it kind of connects in together. But you could have a conversation with Jordan Peterson where you veer away from those topics and you mainly talk about polarization and talk about, you know, the psychological issues with liberals and it would go very smoothly, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I've seen a lot of people do that. And I think to your credit, that you often are willing not to do that as demonstrated recently with Jordan to good effect. Yeah. But the, even though he then regarded you as like, you know, too uh, <laughs> yeah, no. too argumentative. But what you talked about in regards, you know, the left being more effective at, at making its content entertaining or uh, like rhetorically effective right, and engaging. Isn't there the issue that if you optimize for that, that you create Hassan and BreadTube? like where you just get a flip side where there's a lot of rhetoric, a lot of like strong personalities and, you know, demonizing outgroups and that can appeal in the same way and package a message effectively. Whereas, you know, if you are in a sense advocating for something which is more moderate, it's ultimately going to be more boring in a sense, because you're not saying there's going to be a revolution. You're not saying 
that you know there is a savior who's going to come and there'll be a utopia and that you all get to be revolutionaries you're saying you get to make incremental changes for like legislation over successive administrations like is that a sexy message or do you have to inject like you know drama and stuff in order to make people pay attention to that well, I mean, like, yeah, there's the personal aspect. So on presentation, you can be more entertaining, which I think is a big, that's, I mean, that's technically, that's where I cut my teeth was being like the only guy on the left that would debate crazily with people on the right. I'll call people names. We'll scream at each other. We're rolling on the mud. And traditionally online, like lefty people or SJWs, we called them back then before woke became popular, um, were just kind of like pussies. They weren't willing to like get in the mud and, and fight with these people. So that's where I kind of got my initial burst of popularity from. So you can be like, entertaining in terms of presentation. When you talk about actual content, this is a, I think a really weak area of mine that I've been trying to improve a lot, especially I had a conversation with a online content creator called JJ McCullough. And he, he does like a politics from Canada basically. But one thing that I've had a lot of trouble with is I think because I'm such a, um, the way that I approach life and the way that I look at things is, is incredibly discreetly. I'm just not like a narrativized kind of person, like on a personal level. Like if somebody asks me a question about a thing, like I'm like, okay, well, what's like the percentage of this? Or like, what is like, that's just how my mind is like working. And in some ways it's good. In some ways it's bad, especially when talking to other people. But um, w when I come online, I have a, my, my intellectual demeanor is to just nitpick endlessly. So if somebody gives me like, well, these are all the reasons why I like Donald Trump. And it's like, oh, really? Well, what can you say about his legislation? Oh, jack shit. Oh, he did deficit spending. Oh, fuck you. Oh, his foreign policy suck. <laughs> You're retarded. Like, I'll just say like, I'll go on these things. And at the end of the day, um, it can be good rhetorically in some ways in that, well, hopefully I make the other person look bad or I make him look dumb or his fans feel like embarrassed that he couldn't respond to these things, et cetera, oh, whatever. But also something that's missing from a lot of what I argue that I've been trying to add more is you really do need a constructive argument for people to grapple with, for, for people to like latch onto. Like Andrew Tate and all of these guys became popular because they center this locus of control on you that makes you feel like you are your own person that can, you know, grab life by the horns and like have a strong influence on your own destiny. You know, like, oh, like when I listen to people on the left, they tell me that white supremacist structures mean I can't take credit for a single thing that I do. And, uh, you know, all of my ancestors were imperialists and I'm, you know, an asshole. But when I listen to Andrew Tate, uh, he's telling me that, you know, all these people are against me, the feminists and all these woke tards and, you know, the IMF and everybody else. But I have the ability to go to the gym and I can buy a sword and walk around my apartment and feel like I can fight the world. And I'm able to, you know, join the man's club or whatever the fuck they have and like take it and, and sell crypto and do all this. Right. Those people are really empowering because they give you something to latch on to and they make it feel like you're moving towards something like larger, transcendental. Um, and that's a yeah. I don't think you have to be presenting bullshit to do it. I just need to do a better job at presenting that, which I've been trying to do more as I hone in on like the, like in my last debate, like I try to point this out now a lot, like the, this country is like so cool. America, well, maybe not to you guys because you guys are in not America, but for me, it's, it's America. Right. Like, yeah, it's all right. Yeah, like I, I did a debate on Fresh and Fit where we're talking about like is Islam, like should it be the best religion or some bullshit? And I'm like, I just want to point out that we've got like a Sudanese immigrant. I've got this guy from, uh, I think the Middle East. I've got you who I don't even know where you're from. And my mom is like a Cuban immigrant. And like all of us are here having this conversation with no worry about the police, no worry about anything else. You guys are making money in a capitalist environment. All of this is happening in the USA, in the United States of America, not under some crazy totalitarian regime, not mm -hmm. in a place where women can't vote, not in a place where there's a mandated whatever bullshit, but it, like with all the freedoms and liberal things that we can enjoy here. So yeah, that's like a weakness of mine. I need to do a better job at being constructive. And I've been trying to get better at that. Um, but I think you can do it without being sensational. Yeah. I mean, I mean, one little part of what you said that rings true Ed, from a psychological point of view is that while it may be true that you know, you're constrained by society, by context, by who knows what. But it's always a good idea to build self-efficacy because, you, you know, that is ultimately the thing you've got under control. So I can see the appeal of people like um, Andrew Tate and a lot of the right-wing influencers who do that. I mean, the one caveat with Tate, I guess, is that he also appeals to a certain sense of masochism, I suppose, because he also tells people, his audience, that they're pathetic and uh, um, like unless <laughs> they conform to his some crazy standards that he's got um, a little bit i think it's really important i think it's really interesting when you consider these things i call this uh, like cheerleading disguised as criticism um sometimes people have done a really good job at taking a criticism or what appears to be highly critical and making you feel like you're taking a criticism but really they're just cheerleading you right like if i go up to a guy and i'm like listen up okay you fat sack of shit. You need to get up. You need to go to the gym. You need to get better. You need to better something to do this. Now, a person hearing that might like from the outside and then they might present it as like, well, no, look, like I'm being really, cr I'm pushing this guy really hard. And it's like, well, kind of, but like he knows this already and you're telling him really what he wants to hear, right? Like, 
being told like, you can do it. You can make something more of yourself. You have the ability to change like the course. You're like, that's a message that you like. You know, what's not fun to hear is somebody telling you like, hey, listen, you haven't talked to your mom and dad for four years because of a mistake you made. You need to go and apologize to them. That's a like, when somebody's giving you things like what the Tate say, and it sounds critical, but your emotional response is this like visceral excitement, you should pause for a second and be like, okay, wait, hold on. What's the likelihood that every time somebody challenges me or expresses skepticism, it's making me feel better and better and better and better, right? A really good critical thought should give you a level of discomfort for a bit where it's like, ah, oh, like, do I really want to like confront this person and like express this particular thing? Or like, oh, do I really need to like say this? Like, if that feeling is never happening, then nobody's actually challenging you in a meaningful way. They're just like cheerleading you and calling it criticism, but it's not actually, it's what you want to hear anyway. From the content that we look at, we see that dynamic play out a lot, but there's a, there's another aspect to it where yes, it, it can be presented as, you know, like, uh, the situation you're in now is like kind of shit, but there is a path out, right. You know, like the, that's kind of being presented, but there's also this aspect where the guru people that we cover, they engage of one, one or two ways, or they can do both of this. And one is to like big up their audience, talk about how they're, you know, the kind of people that care about injustices in the world. They are people fighting back about, you know, the, the real issues in society and so on. And then there's the, the kind of nagging side, which is like most people don't understand this. And, you know, you're all not going to get this. But if you do, you're going to be, you know, on the first step to getting to the right space. So there's like this kind of nagging aspect of, you know, you could be better if you just were able to put in the effort. And that can sometimes also take the form, and this applies to your neck of the woods, that when you're telling your audience, like, you know, via the people that you discipline on streams, like, okay, you think better, fuck off, right? You then kind of let people know what behavior will be rewarded and not. And we saw like Eric Weinstein do this with his audience where he was getting criticism from people like us and other people. And he went on his discord and kind of said, you know, if you guys don't do a better job of, you know, kind of policing the kind of criticism that is appearing in this discord, I might have to pull back, you know, and just not interact as much. And it felt like, Oh, that's because you could see the people were, you know, really invested in him, you know, taking part. So yeah, it's just, uh, there's a lot of ways to manipulate people like for combining negative and positive, like, uh, yeah, messaging. Yeah, for sure. None of it is necessarily bad. It's just, um, the application of all of these things is so important. That's why when I debate people, I like always try to push for examples and I always try to give examples myself because you can get people that can lay out a lot of theory next to each other and be in complete harmony where it's like, I think that, um, we need to stop the indoctrination of children. Um, I think that children should be able to grow up free and happy and healthy. Um, I think that parents need to be able to protect their children to do what's right. And then one guy will be like, that's why 14 year olds should be able to take hormones. And the other guy will say, that's why we need like state mandated religion. Like, they, like everything will line up. And then when you hit the applied part, for an example, it's like, wait a second, what? Um, you realize that the theory is so vacuous or abstract that you could truly insert any value there. This is why I don't like to say, um, I don't, I hope I don't hit on things you guys have said before. I don't, I'm not trying to be mean or anything, but like <laughs> people will ask me, people will say things like, oh, like, how do you keep yourself free from bias? That's a really interesting question. And when somebody asks somebody that and I hear the answer, I immediately know if they're full of shit or not. Because the number one bullshit answer that people give is go, oh, well, I read a, a wide variety of media sources. So what the fuck, what? That doesn't mean anything. You read a wide variety of media. You can read a ton of shit and still be a biased dipshit. Like, what do you mean? Um, there are a ton of like mental safeguards that you can have. Like, can you argue both sides of an issue uh, incredibly convincingly, right? Such that you should be able to argue anybody that agrees with you and, and put it uh, or disagrees with you and put a convincing argument on the other side. Or um, if somebody were to ask you the question of what would it take to convince you otherwise of this position? Do you have an answer for that? Or are you like, well, I don't know. I don't think I can be. And I've had people tell me that. I don't think anything could convince me otherwise. Like, Wait, what the fuck? Um, you know, are you well read into a topic such that you could explain it at a decent level? Like if you say, I think Trump made America better. You're like, oh, well, how? This happened. I don't know. I just did a debate with Gorka and I had to cut him off I think, like mm. two or three times where I was like, did Trump, how did Trump make America better? And he's like, well, the economy did better. I'm like, no, no, no. What did he do? 
as well, I'm getting there. And, and unemployment is like, okay, well, what did he do? And he's like, well, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, if I stand next to a tree and the tree grows, I can't take credit for the tree growing. It just happened while I was there. Um, and the inability to like critically engage with questions like that, where it's like, okay, well, what are you doing to actually engage in critical thought? I think is usually a big indicator that that's not happening. So putting examples down for applied stuff rather than just laying out a bunch of bullshit theory um, is really important. Otherwise, yeah, I don't want to be standing next to some dude and we're ending up, we're agreeing on all these abstract points. But then when I look in practice, this, I see that we're like on worlds apart of, of things. I'm like, well, no, hold on. Fuck this. I don't agree with you when you say that. Wait, well, clearly something is like disconnected here. Yeah. Just before we leave this topic of some of these characters like Tate, you've got this great track record in terms of debating with some pretty extreme and dark characters. Mm-hmm. Nick Fuentes, I think Laura Southern, is that right? Mm-hmm. Um, um, but, you know, at the same time, there's also been like a fair bit of content where, you know, you've, you've like, I don't know how to put it exactly, but there's a, some level of camaraderie or we're like at least friend, if not friends, friendly. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's, that's essentially it. Perhaps there's an issue there, I guess, in terms of like, I, I get that, I get that one shouldn't sort of pretend that they're sort of some sort of inhuman monster, you know, um, mm-hmm. and um, they are human beings as well, but there can be a subtext there, right. Which is saying, oh, you know, like I, you know, I disagree very much with, with his views, but, you know, I really respect his, his, his work ethic and in doing this. And it was, it was great to do this thing with them or whatever. And there, there can be a subtext where they're, they're kind of okay, right? And legitimizing them. Yeah, I think this goes back to the, um, there's so much to dig into. Like I've, I've been like exploring this. I've been writing a lot of thoughts down on this relating to aesthetic and function. I think a lot of the criticisms that I get are people that think I do things as an aesthetic r- rather than functionally. And I don't blame them because it usually 99% of the time it is the case. When I started getting into political debate in 2016, my style was very brutal. Like the goal of me was to make your p- political idol look like an, an uninformed buffoon. And then that's how I would pull people over to my side. They would email me and they'd go like, man, like I really like this guy. And then I saw him like flounder so hard in this debate and I felt kind of dumb. So I started watching blah, blah, blah. That was like my initial stuff. Since then, I think definitely like 2019, 2018, 2019 onwards, I'm trying to take more of like an empathetic approach because I think if I can get into somebody's world a little bit more and then argue from their perspective, um, I think I have a better job like pulling people over. And that involves getting substantially closer to some figures than most people would otherwise. Whether or not I get too close to some people or I humanize some people too much, I mean, like there's good arguments on both sides of that. Like, you know, should you, you know, debating Nick in person, maybe okay, but like going to dinner with him, is that okay? Um, Or, you know, like debating this person, is that okay? Uh, But like, you know, giving her tips or moderating a debate on her side, is that okay? I think there's like good, I think there's like a really rich, like, like a a ton of stuff to dig through there that you could argue on both sides. Um, I think that the conversation though is usually poisoned by the fact that the vast majority of people that stand next to somebody and say like, oh, well, I might not agree with everybody who says, but I think I can still be like friends with him. Usually when somebody says that, they are full of fucking shit and they will co-sign 99% of that fucking person's opinions. I have almost never in my fucking life have I heard somebody say, listen, like we disagree on a lot, but we can still be friends. Really? Well, what the fuck do you disagree on? Like show us. I never see that ever. So when I say it to somebody, I can understand at least on an emotional level where you're like, sure, you disagree with him. And like, you guys are like eating dinner. Yeah, what disagreements do you have? And they might not know like, okay, well, like I've done like 50 million fucking debates where we're screaming at this guy blah, blah, blah. Like I, I'm, I'm sympathetic, empathetic even towards the emotional feeling there. Yeah. Cause it, yeah, it usually is, it usually is bullshit. <laughs> yeah. I, I think there's the issue that like, as you say, this is something that everybody says or, or a lot of people say, and it disguises an actual ideological overlap. That's huge. Yeah. Um, but there's also the issue specifically in your case, like, I mean, recently I heard how much you annoyed Nick Fuentes and Sneeko by coming into the Twitter space, right? Mm-hmm. And and basically shitting in their party. And uh, and that was very enjoyable, right? And I thought the way that you interrupted their kind of backslapping session was effective and could possibly only be done by someone who was taking the kind of tone that you did, where, you know, you weren't a pushover, but you were effective at, at yeah. like laying, like kind of responding in the way that they would talk over people and that kind of thing. So... I completely get, and I think that that was, as a result, they were very annoyed about you being on the space, right? Mm -hmm. And you won't see that with pretty much any other left-leaning streamer that I can think of offhand. Maybe there are that I'm just not aware of. But the the other part and the part that Matt, I, I think, is raising is that 
when I see people presenting it as if you and Nick are, are great friends, that's obviously not true. There's obviously like an ideological vibe and you can see it just if you listen to like you discussing things. Mm-hmm. But then when you hear you and Nick interacting about things like content creation, right? And talking about his community and how, you know, he's got a political movement, which he's, he's taking steps or Lauren Southern is making documentaries. She's got a good work ethic and that kind of thing. And it, that does then um, end up like feeling like, well, but Nick Fuentes at heart is an anti-Semitic pro theocracy ethno-nationalist, right? So like mm-hmm. it, the people are correct when they're like his his community building and stuff is to build a community which deserves disdain in a way like for because it's a it's a hateful community and i i guess in that respect you know like you say there's perfectly good arguments on both sides about the way to respond to that mm-hmm. but do you see much effect from when you engage in those because there's going to be the effect that like it's content generating it generates drama and it you know it it gets attention in that respect but do you see much effect from Groypers completely leaving that ideology and becoming, you know, more moderate and that kind of thing? Or is that too much to hope for when that is occurring? Because I'm sure there's isolated examples, but I mean, you know, generally speaking, is it more on the side of generating content entertainment and less ideological like shifting or where would you put the balance. Well, it's really hard as a political person to ever draw a distinction between the two, because you can always make the argument that the stuff that gets me more views and is more entertaining will get me more eyes and is more politically effective, right? Like activism is theoretically more powerful, the more people are looking at uh, whatever you're doing. So that's a careful trap I have to not fall mm. into because there are a lot of things I could do to maximize viewership. And then I can like post, not even post talk, I could prospectively justify by saying like, well, listen, like, I know this is going to be like, uh, kind of a sellout thing here to my values, but it's going to get so many eyes on me and I can convert these people later on, blah, blah, blah. So it is possible to bullshit yourself that way. I would say that when I'm looking at doing things with other people, th- there are two things going on. One is, <laughs> I don't know if I'm changing my mind on this because I get attacked by so many people, it's pissing me off. But like, um, I try to give people credit where credit is due regardless because like like Hassan is a workhorse. He, like, he works a fuck ton. He's really good at networking. I, and I try to give people credit where credit is due so that when my criticisms come across to people that are more familiar with my stuff, um, mm-hmm. it gives me a lot of credibility. Like one of the reasons why I can step into that th- those spaces with Tate and, and Sneeko and, and have that uh, Twitter call where I eviscerate um, these guys is because there are so many criticisms that you cannot make of me. Like you can't say I'm scared of being in these spaces. I've been on shows with all these people. You can't say that I run from challenging conversations. Tate runs for me. He's blocking me on Twitter. You can't say that I'm not capable of hanging in these types of communities. I, like I will be in here and deal it as much as any of these guys can, right? The credibility building and the fact that I'm willing to give people props where they have it, I think makes it so that when I do make my criticisms, they stick a lot harder to people that are undecidedly in, in these, that are undecided and in, in these communities and to people on the other side. Um, it allows me to, when I do convert people, they stick a lot harder um, because they didn't just hear like one good argument I said or one convincing thing. There's like a whole host of like, I'll give people props when they deserve them and I'll attack them when they deserve them. So if you're coming over to me, it's because you've heard like a comprehensive criticism of a person, not just one thing that stuck well. And then I think it allows me to penetrate into some communities better, although it's hard to see it sometimes because people will still show me with the same things because people are willing to give me that credibility. I don't come across as like some outsider, some woke scold um, who, who's coming in to, to fight with those communities. Yeah. Yeah, but the credibility thing is hard. is really hard to measure because I mean, personally, I could just justify all sorts of horrible behavior. Mm. Like some people, because you could listen to me. Like I just gave that thing on. I just said, well, here's the theory, but the application would be way different. Somebody could be listening and say, well, hold on, Destiny. You just said you hate it when people do that. Now you just gave the theory of building credibility. Um, but what about when you say build credibility, that could be giving uh, credit or criticism to a single person, but it could also be like saying the N-word on Twitter to gain credibility. Like, where does that start or stop, right? It's really hard in, in my mind to balance all this out because there are competing interests on both sides where it's like, well, what is too much? And like, what, what am I doing this just self-aggrandizing under the guise of like political effectiveness versus like what's actually politically effective, but also benefits me at the same time. And I'm not trying to play too much of that. Like, yeah, it's, it's difficult to balance all of that out. So I'm like public about it. I talk about a lot of it because it's really challenging. I'm not doing this behind the scenes or secretly in some fucking room. Like, these are issues that I wrestle with on stream, in writing, on Twitter, like, you know, almost every day, depending on what arc we're in, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I appreciate that. I think ultimately people have got to make their own mind up because everyone can, anyone can say that they've got these motivations, they've got these intentions. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. we've got our own set of things that we proclaim, whether or not 
one should be believed. I mean, I guess you just have to make your own mind up. That is <laughs> people listening. Um, if the, the one thing where we are on the same page is like um, we will always hand it to the characters we cover. Yeah, Peterson, or, yeah, yeah, even when we really, really don't like them, just on principle, <laughs> because I think it destroys credibility to pretend that they can't do anything good when they clearly have got at least this one or two things right. And uh, if you want your other ones to land, then you need to do that. Yeah. You also open yourself up to very scary attacks to where um, <clears throat> cognitive dissonance only works insofar as when you're cognitively dissonant, you can like you can change your mind about a thing to be more in line with reality, or you can change the way you perceive reality or change the reality in front of you. And oftentimes, the reason why we can change how we perceive reality is because you're not usually tested on a lot of the social things that people try to lie to you about. But the further that gets away from the truth, the more of a mind fuck it's going to be when somebody's confronted with it. So like for my case, like if you've listened to things about me on the internet, I'm a racist, pedophile, Nazi, Wikipedia reader who's like, you know, scream slurs all the time and is an idiot, right? <laughs> and the the caricature of me that's built up is such that if I'm ever put in front of an audience and given the opportunity to like have a debate or well-reasoned discussion, there are a lot of people that I will pull immediately that will email me and they'll be like, holy shit, I saw like a full thing of you for the first time and it was completely not what I was expecting. I was like, well, yeah. But the issue there is there's a gambit that's being played on the other side where it's like, well, if I demonize this person enough, hopefully nobody checks this stuff out. But holy shit, if they ever look at it, they're going to see that the reality versus the expectation are wildly divergent. And that's a risky game to play sometimes, but it depends on how yeah. well you can perpetuate the, the exclusion of that, that particular figure. Yeah. On that kind of subject. So you mentioned a couple of like the, you know, controversial takes and, and whatnot that are often cited with you. And um, we, we raised the DDoS kid earlier and um, the N-word usage, right? And I, I, I think one point is that your positions to us in, when we were looking through the things were clear. You know, you tried to emphasize this point that you are trying to make your position understandable whether or not you agree with it that mm -hmm. it's it's upfront and there and that is the case that both matt and i felt when looking at your content but on that regard it also felt like there are times where you may have taken a stance and are now like that is my stance and i will defend it until like the end of time right and and the example the ddos kid is a good one Mm -hmm. Because I, I saw your conversation with the lawyer, I think Pisco Liddy. Pisco, yeah. That is, yeah, and I'm not desiring to rehash all the arguments, but I'm more interested in like whether your defense there is genuine or more like a kind of stubborn enjoyment of arguing a particular position. Like, because you could still argue for your reaction and kind of emotional response, right? And say, yeah, but I wasn't obviously intending to kill the kid, right? And I'm not planning to argue that people can, we should create a society where people can go and kill kids who are doing things like that. But you actually have kind of taken the stronger stance of like, no, I, I think we could conceive of like creating laws where this would be justified self-defense and stuff. But I don't, I can't, that's the part I can't tell how much of that is just like a stubborn personality, you know, that wants to argue a position mm. you've taken out uh, a little bit trolling, or you really sincerely believe that like, you know, that is completely justified. Yeah, I think it's hard to extract the general principle from the particular arrangement because it is so inhuman um, or unrelatable. Like, okay, well, you're a streamer, especially because people might think that like, okay, well, 12 years ago, you're a multimillionaire streamer living a luxurious lifestyle, blah, blah, blah. Like my life situation was a lot different back then. I think I was into my second year maybe of streaming. Um, I'd have to go and check when the particular data stuff was. I think it was my second year of streaming. So like the income was not super ironed out. Like I, there was no, I was not anywhere near like an ultra wealthy person. Like I had a newborn child with a girlfriend that I had a lot of issues with. I had to maintain two separate residences at all time because we couldn't live. Like there was a lot of stress related to that about moving around and streaming all the time. And then I've got a dude that's basically nuking my income for fun the entire time. So that like, that was the context. Now that doesn't necessarily um, make okay or make not okay uh, the, the general principle, but just like the backdrop is a bit different. Like if somebody like, the sympathy for a millionaire having financial issues is very, very, very low, which I'm aware of. I don't usually talk about, I mean, I don't have financial issues now, but I, don't, I wouldn't talk about that like that because it's like so disconnected. People can't even imagine you like having the audacity to complain about the ugly. And the issue when it comes to defensive stuff like that is I feel like the, whatever rule that you craft 
I feel like you on the extremes, I think you run into very crazy stuff on both sides. And it's very hard to figure out where your limiting principle should be. I think that when you look at the DDoS stuff, it seems like the general rule I'm crafting is that like if somebody is taking steps to destroy your income and the police are unwilling to engage, then should you be able to enact, you know, physical violence against this person up to, you know, extermination, up to killing, up to murder or killing this person, right? That sounds pretty unhinged on its own. Um, and then we could start crafting a whole bunch of examples where it's even more potentially unhinged. Uh, what if you're a bird watcher every day and a guy, you know, drives by with a certain car that's causing birds not to park on trees outside your house and you can't make money more? Can you kill this person when they drive by? Like we can think of a lot of scenarios where it's like, okay, well, <laughs> hold on. What what is your what could your limiting principle here possibly be? You know, you don't have a First Amendment protected right to the fucking internet. Uh, what if instead, what if it was a lazy worker that was fucking with your connection because you just didn't do his job well? Can you go? and kill the lazy mm -hmm. like there's a ton of ways you can test that and i understand that um like absolutely but here's the but i think that <laughs> i think that socially speaking okay there are people from san francisco that are pumping their fists in the air, okay socially speaking i think that in some places we've gone too far in the other way where it's like well property is never worth life and you see in some of these cities where it's like you shouldn't be able to kill shoplifters or attack shoplifters or whatever and now you've got like these mass retail thefts or you've got people who just like walk through stores taking everything and walk out because it's never worth it to attack a human or we're stealing things or you know more um more uh more like pressingly you had like the whole blm protest riot stuff where okay sure there might be hundreds of millions or billions of dollars worth of damage caused in certain neighborhoods but they're protesting a worthy cause you don't have a right to defend your property uh it's never never worth it to kill a person for property etc cetera, etc cetera. um and in my mind i feel like that's a bit of playing out like the other end of what that looks like and i feel like we have seen that um i acknowledge that my position definitely comes across as like pretty extreme when you start to get to the like limits of it i definitely acknowledge that i do think that there are people that would agree with my position, not in the extreme, that like um, we can easily think of a million examples of like, well, let's say that you're a sole earner and you've got like a sick wife and, it, and you can't go to work because a guy decides that he wants to set up shop on your driveway and he's not going to let you out. Eventually people are like, well, fuck it. You should be able to run him over. This is insane. You don't want your family to suffer, right? But like, yeah, I, I think that both sides of that get really weird. When you talk about like self-defense or a person's right to infringe on you in like non-material ways where they're not like actually attacking you, I think it looks really unhinged on both sides. So my opinions there are genuine, but I do acknowledge that like, it can look crazy on my end. And like anytime self-defense comes up, peace goes in my chat, you know, like saying like, oh, here he is. Destiny about to give his unhinged fucking fucking takes on this bullshit. And anytime we're watching videos of shoplifting, I'm like, here it is. This is the world that peace go wants where this old lady is going to get robbed and she can't do anything because she's not strong enough to, to wrestle under the ground. So she can't shoot him and peace goes right. Yeah, that's it's a rough issue. But I, I understand why people think that my takes are a little bit wacky, but I'm not like advocating for the murder of everybody. I'm just, it's like, that's like, right. a, that's a tough one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, Chris, I, th I think you got your answer. That was a good answer. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to litigate it. We're going to end it. But sure. I mean, I, I get the argument, which is that and I think the crux of it though, is, is that you make recourse to the authorities and they do not do what they ought to do. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, one of the, what the, the, one of the rules of civilization is that the, the state has a monopoly on violence. Right. Yeah. And there's not even the state can't do anything. There are laws for this. So like what right do you have to go out and enact vigilante justice when the guy's not even breaking the law? Right. Um, and what what possible doors are you opening up for anybody to kill somebody because they're doing what about somebody who's contributing to spiritual decay by kissing their boyfriend as a guy and doing gay stuff? Like, should yeah. you be able to kill this? But like, yeah, I understand it. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a yeah, yeah. for sure. It's a fun philosophical question. I'm just glad I'm <laughs> glad you didn't have to kill the kid. Glad the kid is still <laughs> going. Yeah. You should you should do invite him on, you know, for yeah. the, the podcast. Just like uh, it would be interesting to see how he thinks. about maybe he's very grateful. But uh, but I guess all of the points that you raised are are completely basically what I would have uh, anticipated. But it's the one which just seems surprising to me is that a simple like step back to. You know, the, what you said there is all raising the, the different perspectives you can take and how there could be reasonable objections and there are issues, you know, if you try to apply this rule and stuff. But what you didn't say is like, yeah, and I, you know, I realized that I reacted emotionally in that case and I'm not, you know, like I talked about the potential, you know, how we could go to the house of the kid and the father and, and that kind of thing. But that was, that was just blowing off steam. 
right? And I'm. Uh, yeah, that's I don't know. The bit I, don't know the pro- I don't know what the role <laughs> of the principal there should be. I yeah, I don't have that feeling. It's just an emotional. Fuck those guys. Okay, listen, I don't know, man. <laughs> yeah, this was that. You never bored. I don't know if you have like a video thing, but like, man, this was like one of the emails that I got back because I contacted his father and his family to try to like get this kid to stop. This dad was fucking wild. <laughs> Wow, oh, pissed off dad. <laughs> yeah, oh my god. Yeah. Oh, 2011. So this was about a year in return. Yeah. But yeah, fuck yeah. Um yeah. I mean, I do realize I was emotional at the time for sure. But uh like, yeah, even so, like drawing out the principle, I, I'm not sure. It's a it's a rough one. I totally I'm very sympathetic towards arguments on the other side of that. Yeah. I, when when I when we came across it when we were looking at content, it was like, you know, people sent us messages saying, Have you seen the content where just Destiny justifies killing the kid? And you're like, what? <laughs> and then there actually is like significant yeah. debates about it. So it just, it, given all the other issues, it, surpri- it sometimes surprised me that you were willing to continue to like, because that's that was talked about like a year ago. I find a stream of you debating it, right? And like you said, it's been, a, you know, 10 or 11 years. And actually, now that this is coming to my head, I, I wanted to remember to mention that. Mm-hmm. I did have this question for you and i i guess it comes across as complimentary but i but in another sense it's not so you (laughs) you have like as we've established a high tolerance for for drama a high tolerance for conflict and i i like that the willingness to debate with people and and kind of argue your point of view even when potentially socially uh uncomfortable but the other aspect is like you go hard sometimes in a way like I'm thinking of the uh, antagonizing Islamists, uh, which yeah. you did for a couple of months, right? You had yeah. yourself as Minecraft Steve, uh, like uh, attacking. Uh, I know what you're talking about. The uh, Kaaba, yeah. whatever, yeah. But the thing is, from my perspective, right, people who antagonize Islamists in mm-hmm. writing or online, that often becomes a big part of their life then their security concerns for the rest of their life or in talks, they are constantly messaging about, you know, the concerns they have about dealing with the Islamic extremists who, you know, uh, like Salman Rushdie or whatever, obviously higher, higher yeah. profile. But in that respect, you do have enough feuds, grievances, community. You just recently had uh, left this streamer potentially suggesting that it would be good if somebody yeah, there were like four to... of them that made kind of these suggestions, yeah, all of them yeah, specifically they... not banned on Twitch and recommended by Hassan on a recent Wired interview, uncritically by yeah, yeah. So they bleeped out that the direct incitement to kill you, but the 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 kind of X to Y was very clear. And I, I so this is the bit I'm curious though, like, so you have you're a person, right? You appear in public, you are bound to as your profile increases and all that have con- security concerns and whatnot, but like so. Like, why are you not concerned about the fact that Islamists do attack people for presenting the prophet in, you know, unflattering ways or that kind of thing? Like, why add to your list of concerns by deliberately antagonizing them? And and how is it that you can do that for a couple of months and then move on, like, without it seeming to follow you along? I, I just find that sort of surprising that you are able to move on from that when kind you of say thing. able you mean like because i'm personally able to or because those communities allow me to well both like because why are you not like constantly having to sort out security arrangements mm-hmm. after antagonizing like islamist extremists online well, I, think that seems like- I live in the united states so our muslims here are super cool <laughs> um we don't have we don't have the same kind that kill people in paris or fucking whatever else so that's one thing is that people in the u.s are generally a bit more chill but you travel um, i do you travel yeah. um i don't know i my, some of it might just be like um unwarranted like arrogance because it hasn't happened yet maybe there'll be an event where i'm like holy shit i need to be like super careful but i mean like i i mean i try to be relatively safe in the areas that i go like in some areas i may or may not have security um i mean i don't make that public too much so just to be clear like i'm yeah. not trying to say like detail your security. No, yeah, I understand. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I try to try to, I do try to be somewhat mindful of things, but I also think that, um, man, hold on. I always try to think of like clips that are going to be played after I get assassinated. 
So this is going to be one that's going to be played after I get killed. <laughs> um, people online talk a lot of shit and they make a lot out of nothing where they'll try to like, people will go online and victimize themselves. Like, oh, I got all these threats and blah, blah. It's like, bro, people say dumb shit online all the fucking time. Like, these people aren't going to fucking kill you. Like I've met people in real life that'll come to me like, oh shit, Destiny? And I'm like, oh, are you about to stab me? They're like, no, I told you I wanted to kill you on fucking Twitter. Like I posted that picture of you like getting beheaded, but like, bro, what's up? And they're like talking, it's like, yeah. So it feels like people, I don't know if it's like the age group or if it's like the circles that I'm in. Like people say wild shit online. But it feels like in real life, everybody's been like fairly chill so far. I don't know if that's a result of like my demeanor and my penetration to some spaces and like the credibility that I've bought um, by like participating in these spaces. I don't know if it's because I just haven't ran into the right person yet. Um, I don't know if it's because I don't make these criticisms like central to who I am. Like there's a lot of people mm. I like, a lot of people I have problems with, and I very easily move from thing to thing. Like I don't have to be like, you know, get stuck in the Sam Harris hole of like hating Islam for the rest of my life or get stuck in the mm. Jordan Peterson C16 hole or get stuck in the Brett Weinstein uh, vaccine hole or get stuck in the, mm. like, you're like, it feels like I, I described these on streams like brain break moments where somebody like hates something so much that now like something breaks and the rest of their life is on that one issue. <laughs> there are so many things in life that are interesting to talk about. Um, so yeah, I have no problem like moving on to the next thing. Like I, I don't, like I don't uniquely hate Muslims or uniquely hate Islam. Uh, I just think it's really funny that there's a lot of red pill people that simp for it without having ever opened a Quran in their life. And I think it's really funny how triggered they get online. Um, I, did you guys ever I, see anything about the Hindu stuff? I had a Muslim guy that challenged me because um, some Muslims would come online and, and they would challenge me. They'd be like, well, you never shit on Jews. You never shit on all these other people, blah, blah, blah. You only do it on Muslims because it's safe. And I'm like, well, no, I shit on other people, but it's harder to make them as mad because most of them don't give a fuck about their weird religious shit. So like, I don't, I don't know if this is a thing, but like I've had a lot of Muslims tell me like, well, you know, Jewish rabbi, it, sometimes they bite the foreskin off the penis, you know, for children. And it's like, okay. So like, I'll like try that as a joke. I'll make fun of a like Jewish friend. And they're like, yeah, that's weird. I'm like, okay, well, this doesn't matter. The, one of the funniest moments is I had a guy say, you don't understand how radical Hindus are online. Like they Hindu say- nationalists. Cool, yeah, they mm. say wild shit. And I'm like, I've never heard that before, but fine, sure. So I found a picture of like a, a crazy baby with like seven arms or whatever. And then I tweeted out, I was like, Hindus see this new child and think it's their God or some shit. Like something, it was something during like, I thought it was an AI generated image. And the number one most like comment was a Hindu guy that responded. And his response was, and I felt so bad. His response was, I understand if you're American or something and you have issues with our religion, but it's really not okay to throw a poor child under the bus when you're making fun of us. And that was like the most important thing. Like, oh God, I didn't even know it was a real picture. And I felt horrible. And I was like, okay, well, that's their response. And then meanwhile, I've got like 32 new death comments from like Muslims today because they were mad that I, you know, brought up Aisha or some shit. So I just thought it was funny. But yeah. I've heard Hindu nationalists can go pretty hard uh, mm -hmm. if you get their attention. So maybe Sorry. that, but, but in that case, that... Yeah, that, that does sound like a moment of regret. <laughs> it's funny because like all of these red pill guys say that they're so brave and they blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, well, like go fight with Muslims online. It's funny that you guys are so brave, but you happen to fall into literally the most trendy popular religion right now. Like, isn't that convenient? Yeah. I guess probably uh, one kind of argument that, that people would raise is you don't have the single issue, but you do have Hassan. Oh, uh, yeah, as in, but, yeah. It, yeah, in terms of, you know, like a figure of enduring here, but it's, it's mutual. It's obviously yeah. A listen, would you watch Batman if he didn't have the Joker? Everybody needs their reoccurring okay antagonist. All right, so that's our center narrative building going on there. There was one other thing that I wanted to mention. One of the criticisms that you get most frequently relates to you know reading Wikipedia or or just uh, reading headlines or whatever the case. Well, you don't really get the reading headlines. It's mainly the Wikipedia thing, right? Other mm -hmm. people get the reading the headlines thing, and I am aware from consuming your content and from the, the research that we did, that that is unfair in terms of the research you do. But I think it is fair, and you've acknowledged this whenever you were talking about like uh, kind of chastising academics for the bad job they often do in the topics you're interested in, that there is an aspect where, you know, you have to cram in a whole bunch of material and you're in a sense like kind of taking in a big range of material and, and learning it. But your engagement will be more, obviously, more superficial than somebody whose whole career has been on a topic. Now, it may be that the people whose whole career on that topic have become so ideological that they are also very superficial in their arguments. But like, just in principle, it is the case that, you know, your engagement will be more superficial. And in that respect, is there an issue with that? We have this concept that we talk about with discourse surfing, like when it came to the lab leak, for example, and I've heard you talk about this as well, that a lot of the punditry around it was like ping-ponging between 
headlines, right? The, this intelligence agency says today that this is 5%, you know, like more likely. And then you would get a round of coverage with Nate Silver and various people changing their position. And then mm -hmm. you would get a critical article and you would have the vice versa. And you had people talking about, you were never allowed to even discuss the lab leak and polite conversation when it was the endless conversation I endured for months and months on Twitter and all social media. But in that respect, as I've heard you've described, you're kind of, you know, roughly from consuming the discourse about 60-40 in favor of a natural origin being likely. Mm -hmm. I know you haven't said this is a specialist subject, but Matt and I have spent some time in this and, and talk. We did like a, a three and a half hour episode with a bunch of experts on it and I've, I've spent time with it. And we would say the scientific literature has not been ping-ponging like that and has been just very consistently building up a consensus, which is now pretty strong for a natural origin, such that when they did a survey recently, it was something like 85% of relevant virologists that, you know, oh, interesting. Uh, is there been, was, I, I was familiar with the two, I think there were two big papers that were published initially, maybe both in Nature, um, that like looked at this, like, I think months within the origin of the virus. I wasn't aware of like any other huge papers that had come out. Oh, I might, when I say 6040, I might actually be hedging too much. I'm only, a lot of it comes from the fact that I think either one or some of our uh, intelligence agencies switched their position on it. And I'm like, okay, well, maybe there's something that I don't have access to, maybe, yeah. But this is a good, that's a perfect illustration because there are two papers that like a lot of people reference. One is the proximal origins mm -hmm. one, and then the other one tends to be a letter that was written, I think in the Lancet or, but in any case, like arguing against uh, demonizing Chinese colleagues, right? It wasn't a research sure. paper, but this is what's cited. But there, there actually is, a huge, really robust literature on the topic. There's now like probably hundreds of papers on the topic, but the, it would, it, there's a whole like kind of bunch of evidential lines that are pointing in the same direction. And for Matt and me, because we are academics and like kind of interested in sciencey topics and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. following the research literature was not so difficult because it's not our area of expertise, but we just understand about, you know, following the science literature on, on that topic. But we we saw the discourse all around it. And I think the discourse still is like very much focused in a kind of 60, 40, 50, 50 range. So my, my question isn't specifically that example. That's just an illustration. But how to avoid that occurring in any topic like is it the case that basically just on you have to do a deep dive on it in in every instance or is there some way you know that you can counteract the issue about like the discourse being dominating uh like you know for because like when you talk to jordan peterson right you could see that the discourse had poisoned his mind about the climate change but you yeah. correctly summarized the the literature because you had prepared it uh so that's that's the kind of thing I'm I'm talking about, like how to it might it might only be for scientific issues. I don't know if I have a great question there, but hopefully. No, I understand. Um, one of the so there are a couple of things I think that I'm I'm uniquely suited to do. Um, one of these is uh, I think I, oh no actually I wouldn't say uniquely. This is a practice thing. I, I try to hedge. Uh, an appropriate level of conviction around things that I talk about. So like, even when we're talking here about like the lab league stuff, like if somebody asks me that I'm going to give you an appropriate, hopefully like percentage of my thoughts, but then I'm going to give you like a, a level of conviction, how much reading about it. So if somebody asked me about the lab league. I think my response is usually basically what I just said here. I'm like 60, 40. I think I came for the wet markers. I think there were two papers on it, but I haven't like done like any deep dives into it. And that's it. Hopefully, when you hear me say that, hopefully people don't come away and like, Destiny knows that it came from the wet markets. You're fucking lying. Or Destiny says it, blah, blah, blah. Because I just, I haven't done the reading into it. I, like, I know that people expect you to have a really strong opinion on everything, but like, I can't, I can't do that much reading. Um, so I try to have an appropriate level of conviction based on how much research I felt I've done is the first thing. Um, the second thing is that because I'm a content creator and I get paid absurd amounts of money to do content, I think that you have at least a minimum level of obligation to actually fucking read more than fucking Twitter headlines about the particular things that you talk about. Um, and I don't know if I'm just gifted with my natural 180 IQ massive fucking brain, but it feels like if you're just willing to sit down and like read through some pretty basic stuff, like you can get a huge understanding on a lot of topics, at least very broadly, enough so that you can go through literature on things. Like when people think of well, you guys said you're academics. What is your what are your academic backgrounds? Oh, he's an anthropologist on the psychologist. Hey. 
Okay, yeah. anthropologist. Yeah. I'm, I, I, I teach. Yeah, and I'm then, a cognitive anthropologist, and I teach in a psychology department. These yeah. are important distinctions. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Are you both like, <laughs> so you're like PhD, like defended theses, published, or like go through a lot of research, like that kind of stuff? Um, it's very, very importantly, I'm a, I'm a full professor. He's an okay. associate professor. So uh, that oh, is very important. Yeah, yeah, the hierarchy. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, that's okay. It. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. Okay, well, that's great. I'm just checking. So you can call me out if I say this, because I've said this a lot, and I feel this pretty strongly, but maybe I'm fucking full of shit, okay? I think that the layman's impression, oh, also fuck both of you, okay? Because I think academics have fucked up a lot when it comes to public communication. So now retards like me have to go online and try to argue these fucking, what does antibody dependent enhancement mean and why doesn't the vaccine, like Jesus Christ, well, let me go over this new not fucking us. This, this, this not is us. not gonna work. We're part of the solution. We, okay, we that's good, okay, that's good, yeah. I feel like I did an undergrad level course on fucking immunology just having to keep up because every fucking day was a new conspiracy theory. And it's like, okay, well, what does ADE mean? Or like, what what is there between an mRNA vaccine and like an, 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 an attenuated virus vaccine? And, and none of the academics want to come not say anything so like people like me have to give arguments against fucking robert we, we had to do it we had to do it too <sighs> yeah okay, yeah jesus <laughs> christ um yeah. but um what i was gonna say is i feel like academic papers it feels like when somebody says oh what do you think about minimum wage or vaccines and the thought is like oh my god well what does the literature say and when people say the literature i think layman's think and i used to think this there must be like thousands of papers published about all this stuff. But I think the reality is, is that when you develop like a fluidity in certain academic disciplines, there's usually going to be a few really well-known authors that have published like really landmark papers. And as long as you're like aware of some of the larger papers that have been published, or maybe some of the more respected, like large, like meta-analyses um, or reviews that have come out by like these respected people, you can like pretty quickly, like quicker than, a, a, than you would imagine, can develop like a handle on like, okay, well, like where is the general feeling on this? You know, like if I'm looking at like minimum wage, I know that at some point people are going to reference people like Card or uh, Borjas. Uh, I know that if I'm doing like fucking Evo Psych, that fucking uh, David Buss or whatever is going to fucking come up. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that like they're, yeah, they're, they're like well known names you see. As long, again, and I say this so much, when people ask me, like, how do you stand for it? Just like sit down and read. That, there's no shortcut. It's like asking, like, how do you get ripped? There is no shortcut. You just have to sit down and just read some shit. If you're willing to like download a paper and all you have to do is really read like the abstract and the conclusion, and you can skim through the methodologies. And as long as you're not doing fucking econ, you'll be able to understand most of it, right? Maybe not some of the harder like statistics stuff, but you can get like a lot of information just by reading a paper, um, which is one of the things I like to show on stream. I was like, well, let's just read this paper. Like we can understand most of yeah. it. It's not that difficult. Yeah, you can develop like this kind of like working knowledge in the field. So I have the issue of like, my knowledge level is going to be surfacey, but like I can read and I've got like decent, like uh, comprehensive, comprehensive skills. And I have a huge advantage in that I've got a huge audience of experts that I could theoretically pull from or people that I can reach out to and talk to. And that's how I develop kind of like a, a working knowledge in a particular thing. One of the reasons why I get so mad when people fight with me so much on stuff is like, listen, you're so upset about like my takes about economics or philosophy or psychology or whatever the fuck. Like more from that, I'm just appealing to whatever whatever my understanding is of the current like uh, literature consensus. So like you're really mad at me, but I'm just like saying like, this is what the FDA has like pushed on their website. This is what Nature, Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine has published. Like, fuck, like if you don't like what I'm saying, like, I'm sorry, but like this is where it is right now. Counter me with another paper, right? And it can't be like a, you know, a retrospective sample size, you know, N equals four paper on why ivermectin is going to cure fucking the coronavirus and like, yeah, that's that's generally what I say. Yeah, just as long as you're willing to read and be like epistemically humble about the limits of your knowledge, I, I think you can do more than 99% of people is my feeling. I've seen you engage with academics and everyone in academia knows that there is this, there is the capability for academics to just reference citations and all the things they've read and use it like in a kind of performative way, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, look at all these books behind me on the well, I've read all of these or like reference a study that they know the other person hasn't know any of the details about. And it's just purely as a way to like, it's a, a kind of authority appeal, right? Academics are just as prone to doing that bullshit, if not more so than, you know, people online. And also just to say, I completely sign off on the point about just read, like, mm -hmm. Literally reading a paper puts you above 99% of people. Like even if you don't understand the statistics and stuff, if you just read it, yeah. that's, that, that, that is often a lot more than people will do. So definitely do that. But the one caveat that I think is important is you can learn like a whole bunch of basic principles about, you know, like studies with bigger sizes, studies with controls are better and, and, and so on and so forth. But there are sometimes technical issues in studies and in literature, which make it 
hard for somebody with a layperson's understanding of a topic to properly grasp it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it means that somebody who is a proficient in a topic, say they know statistics well, they can absolutely present it as if the statistics completely undermine the safety of vaccines. And you know that's bullshit, but they're able to kind of, you know, reference uh, like statistics and kind of studies in a way that a normal person can't counter. And we've seen people, I'm acutely aware of this because of the guru space, that there's a whole bunch of them that will make these big long threads where they're referencing studies and they're showing graphs and they're kind of talking about ivermectin or this thing. And it looks like science, right? Yeah. It looks like a critical evaluation. And I think for a lot of people, the advice of, you know, you go to the literature and just check it is potentially deceiving because if you lack some basic grounding, it uh -huh. can it can lend you the wrong way. So that's the only caveat is like, I still think it's important that people read. I still think relying on headlines or science reporting is, you know, not the way to go. But yeah. there is an issue about exactly what you said about epistemic humility. That uh -huh. we, Like Matt and I are not experts in genetics. So when we look at the lab leak, we can like see, you know, the, the general contours of the literature, but we cannot assess the quality of the genomic analysis because we've never done that. <laughs> like, so we'd be, we might be able to follow it, but you know, we have yeah. to rely on, on like building up an expert like yep. network that we can trust. So for sure. Yeah. That was just things that were ping ponging. Yeah. I think on that, um, there's a couple things I'd say. So first is, if you're in that level of like political discourse, you're already really like into the weeds um, in that like, I don't think it would be nice actually if this was the case. I wish that more people would argue with bullshit graphs and numbers than just the empty platitudes. But I feel like 90% of political discourse is like the empty platitude bullshit that you see on, you know, on Joe Rogan or from... I guess from the gurus or whatever, um, yeah. or, or, you know, like it's, 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 it's not going to be, um, yeah, it's not gonna be like, here's my G wash on like how I understand that this is that, but it's going to be Jordan Peterson saying like 20% of excess deaths are caused by the vaccine yeah. uh, in Europe. Right. Yeah. It's going to be stuff like that. The two things that I would say, and, and now, um, I have to rely on my strength of philosophy and intuition. And I would say these are two heuristics that I use to try to keep me safe from those things um, when I see those pop up. And I'm using a heuristic here because it's a substitution of expertise. I can't be expertise in everything. Here are two things that I try to warn people against. You can tell me if you agree if these are good or bad. Um, the first thing is, is you should be very, very, very careful when a layman is eager to disagree with the conclusion of a study using the figures from the study. And the reason why is because if somebody has gone through the effort of deciding which variables to control for, of collecting the data, of writing up the entire paper and publishing it, that generally the process of doing that, the methodology and everything is more difficult than just drawing the conclusion. So if you're getting somebody who's a layman, who's very eager to point to one or two figures in the study and disagree with the conclusion, it's interesting that that autodidact, or it's interesting that that layman was confident enough in the data collection and principles that the researcher used to cite their own stuff, but then completely disagree with the conclusion. Now, I'm not saying it's always wrong that that'll never be the case, but that's one thing. If you get a guy who's like very eager to disagree with all the conclusions of these researchers, but he's very comfortable citing all of their figures and their methodologies and everything to arrive at right before the conclusion, that's a red flag, not necessarily about a red flag. And then the second thing is I always stress like effect size, that if somebody were to come out with a study tomorrow and they were to say, actually, um, a new study was published, um, decent sample size, you know, 800 people, perspective, RCT, whatever the fuck, okay? And this shows that if you take ivermectin, you actually have on average about a, a, like a 12 to 24 hour earlier recovery from COVID. I would look at it and I go, it's been studied so much. It's like, but okay, well, well, maybe, whatever, right? Because if all the literature so far shows that nothing is happening and a new study comes out that shows, well, maybe something is happening a little bit, the effect size is believable that this might have been something that an earlier study hasn't caught. But if there's a whole bunch of literature about a particular thing and somebody comes out with a new study and they're like, we just did a new groundbreaking study on ivermectin. Holy shit. It it's a prophylactic. It completely gets rid of COVID. If you contract the virus, you don't even develop the disease. 
well, that's a huge effect size. How did every other researcher miss this if it's such a well-studied thing? That effect size, doesn't, it doesn't make sense that it would have that dramatic of an impact and everybody else that study this has missed it. So those are like two like heuristics that I use to like see if somebody's engaging in some like wacky bullshit. Like, well, why haven't you published any literature of your own? Why are you relying on their, all of their things except for their conclusion? And then like, how are you coming up with an answer that everybody else has missed so far worldwide? Like that seems really suspicious to me. Those are two heuristics I use. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if you have any other suggestions for some or if you think those are well, dog shit or... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I have. Uh, well, I think your heuristics and uh, are good, both the ones you listed then and the ones you said before. And I think you are, you know, you are you are proof that a reasonably capable layperson who is willing to do some work can can get their head around a big issue. It could be climate change, it could be vaccines, ivermectin, you name it. It's it's you know, it requires some effort, requires not being like a conspiracy theorist, like hunting for hunting for the answer that you want. So the motivations mm -hmm. are important. Um, your heuristics are good. There's probably a bunch of other more detailed ones. You're right about the red flags about that that selective like like someone who goes through a someone who does not work in that area, but is going through a particular study and finding like these little minuscule red flags. We've seen conspiracy theorists do this all the time. So that is absolutely a red flag. Um, yeah. selective fighting, uh, selectively citing certain figures. I mean, the most efficient way uh, I find in, in getting my head around the, the answer to a question from a literature from which I'm not an expert in, of which there are an infinite number of them, Man. which is that you can go an awful long way by don't try to like, don't be focused on reading the primary literature, like that is the empirical, each individual empirical study. If, if it's a big enough topic, there will generally be good review articles, good summary articles, good meta-analysis articles, you know, pay a little bit of attention to who the names are, where they're coming from. Just, you know, you can get the vibe about whether or not, because there's, there's an awful lot of crap published, obviously. So you just have to have that ability to sift through the number of citations, Google Scholar, things like that. You're like, just, just like, though, there's a bunch of easy ways to, to identify the quality stuff. And, and you can read the, like, you know, you talked about reading the the abstract and the conclusion or, or whatever like that's good that's fine and and you can you can skim essentially don't try to be like an independent like you know and provide an independent critique on the methodology trust the discipline to do that but what you can do is get a good sense of what the consensus is by a relatively high level scan so um uh -huh. Yeah, that's that, that's what I would. I, you can also you can also get really good responses by just reading response papers. It's funny that like if you dive into certain yeah, topics, yeah. you can read a paper and a response. And I'll be arguing with somebody. It's like there are really good responses to some of the things I'm saying, but you like don't even know them. Or this is a this is like an obvious red flag. It's a stupid thing. But like somebody will say something like, "Oh, I remember this was one." Nature published a massive. I don't know if you call it a study or like a database analysis or whatever the fuck. But it was it was the hundred million traffic stops. It was 100 million traffic stops to look and see if police were racially profiling drivers based on what time of day they pulled people over. And I think this had some complicated math in it, but I, I read through this whole thing. And, some, and it's always funny when somebody does a thing where they're like, well, what about this thing? Do they even consider that? And it'll be the most obvious fucking thing in the world. And I'll be like, no, you know, all the people that went into peer reviewing, publishing, choosing, this, nobody thought of that. And I remember one of the big pushbacks that I got from that for a person I was debating, they were like, well, maybe black people just tend to work more at night. Like, what about that? And it's like, wow, that's a really good point. Like, what an obvious fucking thing to bring up. But the study was interesting and in that what they did was the period of time that they measured was between daylight savings time to look for discrepancies between arrests because that would shift an hour difference of time, which shouldn't affect somebody's work schedule, but it did shift the amount of light outside because the hypothesis of the paper was that you were less likely to get racially, racially profiled at night when you couldn't make uh, make differences of between the races of the drivers or whatever. So that was funny because, because such an, it was such an obvious exception. Like, well, what about this? And I was like, okay, well, I... I glimpsed the methodology and obviously they take that into account more often than not. They will. If you've ever, I call these like level one objections where you'll say something and people will be like, well, what about this thing? And it's like, yeah, do you don't think the person fucking thought about this? Like Jesus. Yeah. There's like a journal, for example, called behavioral and brain sciences where they have the target article and then they have about like 15 responses and then the mm -hmm. authors respond. So like reading that is kind of getting a crash course and all the different opinions that people yeah. have on a, a specific topic. But the, one of the things I wanted to say, which like shows an overlap in the kind of point you're making is that, you know, when you're talking about like, uh, what is it? Clip monkey or whatever, like clip chimping, clip is chimping, that it? Yeah. Where people, yeah. Where people take the worst thing you've said and, or, you know, like take something, uh, in isolation and then focus on that and don't look at the rest of the context. And with that proximal origin paper, you mentioned, that's a short paper. 
like five pages long. There is one paragraph and in particular one line, and that's all that is in the discourse about it. Now, if you read the whole paper, they are actually encouraging people that like there could be more evidence that comes out that points more to a lab leak. But this one sentence and line is used to present that they completely closed off the possibility. And I'm always like, that paper is like five pages long. Yeah. If you read it, 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 what you just exactly said, that like it's clear that's not what they're arguing, that nobody can look at this topic anymore. But it it's in the same respect. And people end up, you will see people reference that paper, but they'll only ever reference that one paragraph from it. And we spoke, the, you know, the authors on it, um, on the podcast that we have. But when people look at like their Slack messages and all this, it's it's very similar to the climate gate where they are talking like normal people revising their opinions, sometimes saying, well, maybe this would be more likely or whatever. But it's it's always like one sentence taken out where it sounds nefarious. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, like, but when you take it in totality, they're just drafting the paper together and they put what they think in the paper. So like, I think you would have a lot of sympathy with those people that they put in a paper what they think and yeah. people are constantly saying that's not what you actually think and they're like we wrote it down yeah we wrote it and published that's also, it. that should that's a i i, oh, I almost said that there's a horrible 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 the worst words ever uttered okay common sense okay but like this is a thing where somebody will bring to me a, a, a thing this was really common for the October 7th attacks. Um, Blumenthal and the Gray Zone started citing this. Mm. Well, actually, a lot of civilians, the majority of civilians were killed. Um, and the sourcing for this was a Haaretz article. And my immediate my immediate thing was like, okay, there are some things where if you tell me them, I guess this is similar to the effect size argument. There's a thing where if you tell me, okay, hold on. I know this isn't true. Because if it was true, I would have heard about it. Okay, it's like it's like a, it's like somebody coming up to you and offering you a penis enlargement pill. There is no penis enlargement pill because if it was true, it would be on every <laughs> fucking corner in America. They'd be sold in gas. Yeah. Yeah. I know that there is no penis enlargement pill. It's not true. Um, and and when I dug through this Haaretz article, so I don't read Hebrew. I know fucking Bloomin fuck doesn't read Hebrew. Uh, and you click the translate button. If you go down like. 12 paragraphs, there's like one sentence in here where it talks about how some of the IDF was fighting in um, some of these, um, I, I think one of these or a couple of these kibbutzes for a couple days before they managed to clear out all the terrorists. And they talked about the difficult decision of firing on site of home, not knowing if, if a person was in it, right? And the immediate common sense, the immediate like, can you parse media intelligently is like, hold on. You're citing this one sentence here to make this claim. Don't you think that if the purpose of that sentence was to illustrate the majority of civilians were killed by the idea, wouldn't that be like the fucking headline? Why would you bury the lead like that on a story? Similar to your paper where it's like, hold on, they're making this extreme statement, closing off all future stuff, and it's hidden on page four in like sentence seven of this paragraph. Like, don't you think that would be like the opening or the conclusion if it was that big of a deal? Like, why is nobody else talking about this? Like, bullshit. Yeah, that should be one of those things where you immediately like mind correct. You're like, wait, hold on. If this was the case, I feel like the world would look a lot different in terms of the presentation of this. Yeah, I think the also the parallel that you're talking about is that you know there are plenty of articles that make claims, right? And when you have a bit of media literacy, you can even see an article comes from a reasonable source. It doesn't mean the conclusion or the evidence that they provide is is yeah. correct, right? Like, and oh. in the same way with journals, there are good journals. There are journals that are famous. And there are articles in them that are that are dog shit. And you, you have to be able to assess the quality of research, but that's not so easy in the same way that like assessing the quality of journalism. It's not one individual thing, right? Like if you know that a journalist is very biased towards a certain conclusion and they're citing sources, like for me, whenever people cite the gray zone, it's almost immediately a red flag that they yeah. lack at least, a, you know, a healthy degree of skepticism about the, you know, the ideological bias that places can have. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's there's like parallel things, I think, in academia yeah. that apply. I mean, The Lancet was the journal that published the original vaccines cause Andrew autism. Andrew Whitfield. Yeah. 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 Um, that people's, <laughs> people's poor, oh my God, these are some of my most trying times. When I'm arguing with somebody over like, what's a good source or not? Again, this is like a level zero conversation. When, when I'm talking to somebody and I'm like, okay, well, okay, so you don't believe this? Happened? Okay, well, let's go through this and I'll throw them an article and they'll be like, really? Uh, CNN, 
Fox News. Like, no, you fucking moron. They're quoting a, they're quoting somebody from the government. I'm just giving you the article so you can see the quote. Now, unless you think the article is misquoting the person or publishing a wrong quote, the source is not fucking CNN. The source is the prime minister. The source is the president. The source is this. Like, mm. We can find 20 different articles that source the same quote, or we can find a statement from the government itself. That's not, But people will look at something like, oh, your source is Twitter. No, Twitter doesn't publish news. What do you mean? Or your source is like, it's like, no. Oh, yeah. People's lack of media literacy and just even understanding what a source is or what they're reading is incredibly frustrating. Yeah. I'll argue where, like, somebody will say, like, oh, I've got six studies, and they'll link me six different news articles that all link to the exact same study. I'm like, bro, <laughs> my God. That, that also happens in academia. There are layers of bullshit in academia, <laughs> unfortunately. I mean, you know, sure. you. You, you were dissing them before, but you, you missed on the point because we would throw them all under the bus quick as look at you. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Um, you know, yeah. and like, you know, some disciplines are better than others, right? Don't trust psychology as much as you trust virology, right? There's just natural, natural distinctions there. I mean, I mean, some areas of psychology are good, like my area is great, but, you know, take mm -hmm. positive yeah. psychology, it's full of bullshit, right? And, you yeah, know, yeah. so, yeah, you can't just count citations and you can't just, you know, you know, yeah. there, there, there aren't simple heuristics. There is... Uh, there is a vibe <laughs> that, yeah. that comes from but having a, a that view. Yeah, working knowledge in the field. Yeah, yeah. But look, Stephen, we've we've kept you over a lot of time, and unlike somehow you didn't reduce the time uh, at the start of the meeting, so that's that's appreciated. But there was one very last thing that we have to address, and it, you know, we got a lot of feedback from a lot of a lot of your problematic stances and stuff and things that we. We need to bring up and need to address for you. But this one, I uh -oh. think, is possibly the most important. Okay. And it's your terrible, terrible takes on food. All right. I am cutting you're, it short. I am cutting <laughs> it short. Yeah, like, I, I, as someone living in Japan, I just have to say that, yeah, that I, I've seen some of your takes and you need help. The rest of it, you know. Give me one they, you they're... disagree with. Give me one. You don't eat things from the sea. Oh my You're God, Clark, you're in Japan, so you can say that. Yeah, listen, we crawled out of the sea to get away from that world, okay? Why do you need to eat bugs and weird? We have cows, okay? How many people can you feed with a crab? I haven't he heard any of these bad food tweets or opinions. Um, what's a good food then, Destiny? What's a good food? Steak. Well, that is obviously. a good food. That's yeah. as easy yeah, as... Yeah. Like, that's yeah. as right. easy Maybe as... Most food. of my food takes are reasonable. I just like, I hyperbolize it a bit and it triggers the fuck out of people. Like, I personally... Like I'll eat Mediterranean food, but I think it's actually kind of boring. And I think it's funny when people like overhype things like hummus. And it's like, it's hummus is okay. But I'm never like super excited for hummus or like uh or like guacamole. Like I'm never like, oh my God, this is like yeah. So yeah, you know. But I'm, I think I'm in danger like, of agreeing with those two takes. Yeah, but, yeah, but still. Yeah, they are, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But still I will I say in defense it. of because I have gone to now a lot of nice seafood places, whatever. I can eat seafood. I can tolerate it. Okay. In defense of my <laughs> anti seafood take. I was born and raised and lived in Nebraska for 30 years. Oh, no, If you've no. ever had seafood that has like a fishy taste, it, the association is immediately fucking horrible. And uh, yeah, I okay. can't eat seafood. I just wouldn't choose to do so because I just have such a negative association with it. But yeah. I'm from Belfast, which the food culture in Belfast is, you know, people talk about food deserts, but that is a, that's an entire country that is desertified. But I was forced by university and, and encounters with other people to expand my repertoire so if i can do it steven anyone anyone can but uh yeah that's all right we'll let it slide thank you destiny for coming on and um exercising your right to reply you didn't unfortunately dispute much you know <laughs> yeah. we we, yeah. we we had I a good my, chat anyway i think the final takeaway from everything is that like in terms of like disputing much like i think that there are good criticisms you can make of me like there are like there must be because i can look at anything i've done five years ago people are like oh why don't you write a book or get blah blah and it's like because i i end up changing my mind on a lot of things so they are good things to disagree with me over and they're good arguments to be made against things i've said and i've changed my mind on things that i realize like oh this is a bad opinion i just i wish that the criticisms of me would be a little bit more on like what i'm actually like thinking or saying rather than like this unhinged straw man version of me where it's like destiny why don't you just not be pro genocide and it's like okay well yeah thanks yeah that's it yeah i i i do like that the one of the presentations of you from the various orbiting community is that you're mysterious and that your positions are unclear and your motivations yeah. are clear and i i it's just impressive because like uh it's like people have devoted a large amount of their time to try and understand a particular person and have not grasped like the most obvious answer. So 
yeah, that's that's an interesting dynamic that you are a man of mystery for yeah. certain people online. Okay. But keep it up. Yeah, thanks a lot. We don't a endorse lot. all your takes. We've no. tried to explain this to people. We, yeah. We're not. We don't, don't endorse child murder. <laughs> and, and when you become an anti-vax, child murdering, you know, genocide supporter, that is not signed off from us. But we will say that we did enjoy listening to your content a lot more than we did to many of the other people that we've covered. So cool. Thanks, Destiny. That was, uh, that was enjoyable. That was good fun. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Yeah.